let's do it for that one. It should work. You should get a message. Yeah, you should get a message saying, do you agree? Blah, blah. Okay, so a few words of introduction. Let me prepare the slides. Back. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm gonna do this. Okay. And share the screen. Like, like. You should see my slides. Can you see them? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, why are we all here all together this morning? So this is a workshop about the estimation of uh, demographic parameters with capture recapture data. So parameters like survival, recruitment, dispersal. And uh, so to do so, we'll use capture recapture data. We will use a family of models called hidden Markov models or HMMs uh, for short, in short. Why? Because HMMs are quite uh, uh, great, as we will see, because the same model structure, with the same model structure, will be able to fit uh, all sorts of uh, capture recapture models and estimate key demographic parameters. So we'll work within the Bayesian framework for many reasons. Uh, we will develop uh, throughout the, the workshop, but mainly because Bayesian statistics uh, makes it easy to manage uncertainty. And also because with MCMC methods, algorithms, we can fit pretty much uh, any, any models. So what's, what's on our plate? So first things first, we'll go through uh, an introduction to hidden Markov models. We'll talk about uh, survival models. Um, for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Then we'll have a break, a 10 minute, 15 minutes break. Okay. And then we will talk about models to estimate transition between states, geographical sites or breeding states, for example. And we'll have another break for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Then it will be about uh, more advanced stuff and how to account for uncertainty in the Assignment of these states, uh, we'll be talking about two individuals. Again, a 45 minutes uh, session with a, a 10 minutes break at the end, or 15 minutes, we'll see. And also we'll have a session on, on how to save time when running a long analysis on your computer. And that will be the last uh, session. So our philosophy of teaching, it's a big word, but uh, uh, <coughs> well, you are about, uh, oh, can you turn off your uh, mic, please? Your, because I get some, uh, yeah, thank you. So you are about 45 or 44 uh, attendees today. Uh, so there is probably a heterogeneity in knowledge of the method we will cover, uh, uh, techniques and everything. So it's our hope that uh, uh, despite uh, this heterogeneity, everyone will find something uh, to take home. We'll be covering a lot uh, in half a day. So do not feel like you have to fully understand everything at once. Uh, it took us uh, uh, several, I, I should say, years to be uh, comfortable with the material we will cover. And to help, we have made uh, all the material available on the website. Uh, that's the website I communicated with. Uh, I, I sent you by email. So I'm going to try to share it with you. Yeah, that's the, the website. Okay. And on this website, you have, sorry, you have two pull down menus here, the slides. So you have all the slides. And also you have the live demos. So we will go through uh, uh, lines of codes uh, uh, from time to time during the, the sessions. And so you have uh, this, this option here to download all the data sets at once as a zip file. Uh, this one is, uh, you see, you have two, two uh, documents for each uh, live demo. One is the HTML, HTML file, uh, so the slides. And then you have the R script as well. 
so that you can you can pick uh, uh, whatever you want huh? either the the slides or the the R script we will work with the R script it's uh, it's easier it's more convenient and uh, what else uh, no and then you have the github uh, page if you click on this icon you you'll be sent to the to the github page to the github uh, website okay okay so back to the slides let me get rid of that look okay uh well during the during the the sessions uh, feel free to uh to play around with the material and uh, to run some code and uh, whatever you feel like uh, you need to do so as i told you the workshop is organized in four modules for four sessions and each one is a combination of lecture and live demos so the way we will interact with each other uh, simple things uh, just lectures and live coding demos uh, on zoom and uh, we record everything so that it's available afterwards and question and answers via, uh, on zoom okay so while i'm while i'm speaking daniel will uh, answer your questions and uh, vice versa uh, okay i think that's the end for these few words of uh, introductions if you have uh, any questions just uh, just ask before we we start no okay so i'm gonna start right now let me find the slides okay slides okay and here we go And I need to share, of course, I forget, I forgot to share my screen. And this is this one, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so we're gonna start with a simple, so that's the first session uh all about hidden markov models in capture recapture data so it's 10 past nine let's aim at let's aim for 10 yeah okay simple survival example so it's simple it's very relative but uh hopefully this will uh, uh this will help you get uh, get started with a nimble so say we release uh, n animals at the beginning of the winter out of which uh, y survive <clears throat> and we'd like to estimate uh, winter survival, okay? So we have uh, Y is 19, and uh, the number of uh, released individuals is uh, 57, let's say, okay? So we have uh, Z survivors out of N released individuals. Why did I say Z? Well, that's a conflict of notation. It's, it, it shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be Y here, it should be Z, huh? that's fine. Okay, starts well. Um, and they survive with probability uh, phi, okay? So the model is a very uh, standard uh, model. We just have um, the number of survivors is a binomial distribution with uh, N attempts, uh, the N individuals we released at the beginning of the winter, and the probability of success of survival is phi, okay? And we're gonna use a prior for phi uh, this is a probability um, between zero and one. Um, so we're going to use a beta distribution with parameters one, one, which is exactly, uh, which is also a uniform distribution between zero and one. Okay. okay this is also this kind of a, a model where we have Z indexed by I, I for individual. So uh, the binomial is just uh, the sum of Bernoulli, Bernoulli outcomes. So like flipping a coin for each individual i, okay? And we get a survivor with probability phi, okay? For uh, n individuals, it should be a little n. And we, we have the same uh, prior, okay? So this is our model. 
how do we code that in uh, in Nimble? Um, very, it's it's very similar to what you would do in uh, in Jags or WinBugs or or whatever bugs uh, bug software. So we start by writing down the model, and we need the likelihood and the prior, and then uh, the the program will take care of. Uh, um, setting up the MCMC uh, algorithm for you and to uh, yeah to do the rest. So um, the likelihood is just a binomial distribution with parameter phi and n for the number of released individuals. So we need this tilde here, this sign to say is distributed as. And we have the prior here, phi, phi is distributed as a, no, a uniform distribution between zero and one. You could use the beta distribution, but that's exactly the same thing. So you just need to uh, put these uh, two lines of code in this in this function here, nimble code uh, between uh, between curly brackets. Okay. So that's define that defines the, the the model, and then you need to uh, plug in the data, number of released individuals, and number of uh, survivors, and then I use y again. Okay, in Nimble, you'll need to distinguish constants and uh, data uh, because to Nimble, not all data uh, is data. <laughs> so you'll, you'll, you'll learn about that uh, during the, the workshop. Um, at the beginning, it's a bit uh, like uh, disturbing, but you'll see that it's very useful actually to make the distinction, distinction between the two. So here we say, okay, the constants are the number of released individuals, and the data are the number of survivors. So typically, constants can never be changed. Uh, they must be provided when the model is defined. Okay, it's part of the model structure. And well, typically, the constants are the vector of uh, uh, non-index values. When you index, when you need to uh, to to write a loop, for example, that's the 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 end of the, the the length of the loop is basically a constant. Um, so the, to define for loops, for example, it's when you do um, nested indexing, for example, that's uh, what you use as constants and uh, and so on. Uh, data in contrast can be changed uh, without rebuilding the model as we will see uh, later on. They can be uh, simulated within the model. Basically, typically, Data are all the things that only appears to the left of a, of a, of this sign distributed as. Okay. So at the, at the beginning, it's a bit um, difficult to make the distinction between a constant and data, but it's for computational efficiency, it's better to uh, specify as much as possible uh, as constants, and Nimble will help you with this. If you uh, if you specify something as a as data, uh, whereas it could be specified with, as a constant, Nimble will tell you uh, to specify it as constant. So usually it, it goes uh, pretty well. Okay, then we specify initial values to um, to uh, uh, for the for algorithm for the algorithms to uh, to start. So we're going to use a function. We could use a fixed values, but here. Uh, for convenience, we're going to use a function, an R function, and we put in a list initial values for phi. So here it's uh, you generate values, one values in a uniform distribution between zero and one. Okay, so that's the prior for the survival probability. We have only one winter, so it's uh... okay. We can use this uh, function to see what it generates, a value uh, 0 0.56, right? That's fine. And then we need to define which parameters we'd like to save, like in WinBugs or, or JAGS or other software. We're going to call that parameters to save and assign this vector with phi. Okay. And of course, the, the phi should be the one you have in your, let me go back. That's the phi you have in your model. Okay. The, the two uh, should uh, coincide. Okay. We specify some MCMC details, so the number of iterations, the length of the burning period, the number of chains, and some thinning if you want to use some thinning. The only thing you need to be careful is that the number of posterior samples per chain after burning uh, is, is, um, 
is included in the number of iterations. So you see the, num the number of iterations you, um, the burn-in period is included in the number of iterations that you specify, okay? So at the end of the day, the number of posterior samples you will have is the number of iterations minus the number of uh, uh, iterations you specify for the burn-in period, okay? So uh, just uh, keep that in mind. And divide it by the, num the length of the burn-in, the thinning period, okay? But we will use one, so it doesn't really uh, matter. Okay, and there is this nice function in NIMBO that was studied by, by Daniel, which uh, is uh, the, the mirror of uh, JAGS in, uh, in, uh, in the package, for example, R2 JAGS, or it does everything at once. So it takes the model, the data, the constants, the initial values, the parameters you want to save, uh, for which you want to have a, uh, outputs, and the, the number of thinning uh, iterations, number of iterations, the number of uh, uh, burning iterations and the number of chains, and it runs nimble for you. So you can do that if you want, and you'll get uh, some outputs. You can have a look to the outputs uh, with this function as str to get the structure of the object. It's a list of two components because we have two chains, first chain and second chain. And there are 4,000 um, values in the first chain and 4,000 values in the second chain. Why? It's because we specified the number of iterations uh, 5,000 and the length of the burning period is uh, 1,000. So at the end of the day, you have 5,000 minus 1,000, 4,000 iterations per chain. Okay, so that's exactly what we say here. Okay, you can have a look to, the, to these outputs. You can extract chain one, as you would do in a list uh, in R with a dollar sign. And then you see that you have some values. So it's the, the first values of this vector. You have some values that were generated, simulated uh, in the posterior distribution of um, the survival probability. Okay, that's the whole thing with the MCMC methods with some algorithms that we will see uh, later on. So that's the first chain. And of course, you can have a look to the second chain as well. You can have a histogram of these uh, values. And to get those numer numerical summaries, we will use this package cause, called uh, MCMCVs. So if you, uh, if you load it, and then you use this nice function, MCMC summary, which as its name uh, indicates, gets you uh, provides uh, summaries of the MCMC outputs. And then we get the posterior mean, which is a uh, uh, the standard deviation, and then you have uh, the lower and upper bounds of the 95 credible interval. And then we have uh, some uh, diagnostics for convergence, the R hat and the effective sample size. Okay, you can get the trace, uh, the trace, sorry, as well. Uh, you get the trace here. So it's the, the value that takes the, the parameter over the number of iterations here. And then the posterior density as well. Okay, so it's a very useful package huh, that gives you everything in a, in a heartbeat with a, a few functions. Uh, if you tweak a bit the, the arguments of the function, you can get on the same, uh, graph the r hat as well as the effective sample size like here and you can get the posterior density and the trace for each chain separately with a different color you see that here and here two colors red and the, some kind of a green i think or blue okay okay so that's a crash course on uh, uh, on nimble so it's, it's very similar to, to JAX, at least when you use this function, uh, nimble MCMC, it's, it's supposed to mimic what you would do with, uh, with JAX or WinBugs with, uh, within R. When you call WinBugs or, or JAX here, it's the same thing, okay? So it's very convenient and very, uh, well, kind of easy to use once you've defined all everything, all the ingredients, the model, the data, the constant, initial values and everything, right? Okay.
Okay, so that was a kind of an introductory example where you have uh, one winter, some individuals uh, die, some others survive, and um, and uh, you just compute survival from there. So it's just number of survivors over the number of individuals you released at the, at the beginning of the winter. Okay, that would be the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimate. And you get something very similar with uh, the Bayesian machinery. You get, so we got, well, we got 0.34. If you do uh, 19 survivals over 57 released individuals, you'll get something close to uh, 0 0.3333. So it's, it's very similar. The two, uh, the two methods, the maximum likelihood estimate and the Bayesian approach uh, gives you, uh, give you the same uh, results. Okay. What, so in this design, we had uh, a single winter, okay? But obviously we we'll need to collect data on the long term to get uh, uh, an estimate of survival for long lived species or whatever. So therefore, what if we had say uh, big T winters and let's say five winters, this is what we call a longitudinal data, okay? So we, we're gonna denote uh, ZIT uh, for the status of the individual, dead or alive. And this random variable is going to take value one if the individual is alive at winter T and two if it's dead, okay? So you get this kind of, uh, of data set where you have individuals in rows and the sampling occasions here, the winters in columns, right? So let's think uh, of a model for this data. Um, the objective remains the same. We want to estimate survival. And to build this model, we'll make some assumptions. So we'll make uh, some assumptions. <coughs> First, we assume that the state of the animal in a given winter, alive or dead, is only dependent on its state the winter before, okay? Whether it was dead or alive the winter before. So in other words, uh, its future depends only on the present, not the past. This is exactly what we uh, what we use to define the Markov process. Okay, it doesn't have any memory. The future depends depends only on the on the present, not the past. Right? That's a Markov process. And if an animal is alive in a given winter, the probability it survives to the next winter is five. Right? That's a survival probability. The probability it dies is one minus five, the complementary probability. And if an animal is dead a winter, it remains dead, unless uh, you believe in uh, zombies. Okay, the Markov process, uh, you might have seen this kind of a representation, at least part of it. So uh, the state at t plus one here depends only on the state at t, and the dependence is, uh, de is represented by this uh, arrow is orient oriented arrow. So it gets from ZT to ZT plus one. And in our model, going from a winter to the next is driven by survival, the phi parameter, okay? Uh, which is also the mortality process. Huh? And the probability of going from alive one to dead two is one minus phi, okay? The probability of dying over the interval. And once you're dead, you remain dead with probability one, right? So the engine of a Markov model is what we call the transition matrix. Basically, it's just putting everything in a table. Huh? Um, we're gathering the probability of transition from one state to the other, uh, from one occasion, from one winter to the other. For example, the probability of transitioning uh, from state alive at t minus one to state alive at t is the probability, so it's some notation, uh, the probability that zt is equal one, so alive at t, given that you were alive at t minus one, so zt minus one uh, was one, okay? It could be indexed by i, the individual i, but for simplicity here, we just use the time index. And this is, uh, we're gonna denote that gamma one one, the survival, uh, the transition probability gamma one one. So in our case, it's phi, but in other examples, that's gonna be uh, something else, okay? The probability of dying over the interval t minus one t is the probability that you are a tooth at t, given you were 
alive, so 1 at t minus 1. And this is going to, going to be denoted gamma 1, 2. So you see the 1 here is for the state at t minus 1, and the 2 here, the index 2, is the state at time 2, t. Sorry. Okay. So t minus 1, t. t minus 1, t. And here, this is 1 minus 5. Now, if an animal is dead at t minus 1, okay, so 2 at t minus 1, we know that it cannot uh, uh, be alive again, so it's 0. And uh, if you're dead um, at t minus 1, you remain dead at t with probability 1. Okay? By doing that, you can fill in a matrix, uh, which we call big gamma, with all these probabilities here. So that's the transition probability for the Markov, uh, the Markov uh, process chain. So we have phi, the probability of being alive at t minus one and alive at t. One minus phi, the probability of being alive at t minus one and being dead at t. And then same thing for being dead at t minus one and alive and dead. Okay, so that's your transition probability. And we'll see uh, in a minute why it's, it's useful. So again, the transition matrix, we will rely on this kind of uh, formulation a lot during the, the workshop. So just uh, let's just spend a minute on it again. So we have the state at T in columns here, alive and dead. Okay. And we have the states, the same states, uh, alive and dead at T minus one in rows, okay? So you go from t minus one to t, um, and you change state or not. Here you do, you stay alive. Here you go from alive to dead, from t minus one to t with probability one minus five. Okay. So if you if you're not familiar with this kind of a formulation, just spend a, a, a few, uh, some time. Uh, trying to uh, better understand, navigate the rows and columns to make sure that you understand. At the beginning, it's a bit, uh, well, when you, you're not used to it, it's a bit, uh, uh, well, uh, difficult to uh, navigate this uh, kind of a table, but it gets easier and easier, and, and it's very convenient to write down the model as we will see uh, for more complex models later on. Okay. So a Markov process has to start somewhere. So that's what we call initial states. You have to be in some states when you start uh, your fate. And uh, we need the probabilities of initial states, the states at the first uh, time occasion or the first winter, okay? Uh, we will denote this vector delta. So that's the probability of uh, the state at first sampling occasion is one and the probability that uh, your state at sample occasion is uh, the first sample occasion is uh, dead, okay? Alive and dead. So here we will assume that all animals at, uh, are alive at the first winter. So we release everyone at the first winter and they're all alive, okay? Uh, so the probability that your state is alive at the first winter is one because you all released at the first winter, and the probability that you're dead at the first winter is zero, okay? So delta is just one zero. It's a vector with two components, one zero. Okay, the likelihood now. So we need the priors uh, for phi, so we're gonna use a uniform distribution. We need, uh, so that's for the Bayesian implementation, but for the Markov process, to write down the Markov process, you need the initial states and the likelihood, of course. So how to write down the likelihood? Okay, let's let's spend a minute or two on that. The likelihood um, is the probability of the data given the model, okay? And here the data has the, the Z, the, the number of alive. In, for an individual, it's whether you're alive or not at each sampling occasion. So that's it. That's the probability of Z, this vector of alive and dead on each sampling occasion. Uh, for all the sampling occasions, okay, for all the winters from Z1 up to Z uh, big T. We have five winters, so that should be uh, the probability of these five, uh, these five alive or dead states. So we're going to use, uh, we're going to work backward, starting from the, the last 
a sampling occasion, the fifth or the big T uh, sampling occasion. And the, now the likelihood can be written as the product of the probability of um, uh, ZT, that is you're alive or not at the last occasion, given your past uh, history, okay? All the states for the previous sampling occasions. Time, the probability of uh, the states for this past history, okay? That's the, that's the, uh, yeah. So that's how you define the conditional probability, okay? That's the base theorem if you want. Okay. And then because we have a Markov model, we don't have any memory. So the probability well, the, the probability of Zt given the past is actually the probability of Zt given just what happens uh, at the present, Zt minus one, okay? Or the, the, the previous occasion. Okay? We don't need to, uh, to account for what happens, what happens all the occasions before t minus one. Remember, that's a process, a Markov process, right? So you can get, you get that, okay, this formulation, zt given zt minus one, and the probability of all the past uh, events, uh, states. And if you do that, if you apply the same reasoning to t minus one now, this one, you apply the, the base formula and then you say it's memoryless and, and so on. If you go for T minus two and, and so on, uh, then what you get is this formula, okay? You end up with this expression for the likelihood, Zt given Zt minus one, Zt minus one given Zt minus two and so on up to the probability of Z1. So this one is the probability of initial states. And those ones, actually, uh, it's a product of conditional probabilities. Okay, you can uh, summarize, you can condense this uh, notation by using this sign here. That's the product from t the second sampling occasion up to the last ones of the probability of Zt given Zt minus one times the probability of initial states. But those probabilities here, we know them that's the transition probabilities. That's the gamma probabilities we just defined. So actually the likelihood is the probability of initial states time the product of the transition probabilities. That's the likelihood of a Markov process. Okay, um, I'll, I'll put an example if you want to have a look, but we'll skip it for now. And just summarize the model we have. The model we have is that one. So uh, initial state is multinomial with one trial. So you just throw a dice with two faces, a coin or a coin, and you have some probability to be alive uh, or to be dead, okay? And in that case, for initial states, it's delta. So in our case, delta is just one and zero, so it's easy. It's just uh, you throw a, you throw a coin uh, with probability one to be uh, on one face and uh, and and uh, zero to be on the other one. So there is no stochasticity, but let's write it this way because afterwards we need something. Uh, we need the de we'll need the delta and the probabilities won't be ones or zeros. There will be uh, probabilities to be estimated, parameters to be estimated. Okay, for the for the prior and survival. Uh, phi will use the same as uh, the previous example with only one winter, a uniform distribution between zero and one, or beta distribution with parameters one and one, which which is, which is strictly the same thing. Yeah? And then <coughs> the main part is the dynamic of the states. Now, the the going from z t uh, given what uh, in which state you were at t minus one, and this is going to be distributed as a multinomial distribution with just one draw, um, one trial, and with, uh, with probability, the, the, gamma, uh, the gamma probabilities, okay? So it's going to be the, the, the rows of this uh, big matrix we defined earlier. So how does it work? Imagine that um, at Zt minus one, you are alive. So that's the first row of gamma, okay? At T minus one, you are in state alive. 
So you're going to use this row as a vector of probabilities to plug in in this distribution here in the multinomial. So this gamma zt minus one is uh, alive as a t is just phi one minus phi, okay? So the probability of being alive or dead at t is going to be a multinomial with one trial and probability phi one minus phi, okay? In that case, it's very easy because it's just two, two outcomes, alive or dead. So it's just you throw a coin and you get, a, given that you were alive at t minus one, you might be uh, alive at t with probability phi or dead with probability one minus phi, right? And if you were dead at t minus one, then it's the second row of this uh, matrix of transition probabilities, okay? And you will be alive or dead with probabilities uh, zero and one, okay? So here there is no, uh, there is no, uh, no uh, randomness, no stochasticity here, you will be dead for sure at the next uh, uh, sampling occasion because you were dead at the previous sampling occasion, right? That's what the second row is telling you. Okay, uh, this uh, multinomial distribution with uh, a single trial or a single draw is also called a categorical distribution and you can check out the the Wikipedia uh, page for the categorical distribution. And in Nimble, it's called it DCAT, okay? And with uh, some uh, vector of probabilities. So you can, you can simulate values from this categorical distribution in Nimble. You just use this uh, R for random categorical distribution. And let's say we want to uh, simulate uh, 20 values from this distribution with a vector of probabilities 0, 1, 0, 3, uh, 0, 6. So that's three, uh, that's three outcomes, one, two, or three, with probabilities 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.6. And you get those 20 values. You can try it, try out uh, yourself. Huh? And let's say we have, uh, we, we want 20 values, but now we have more outcomes. We have five outcomes with some different probabilities, and you get uh, some values, threes, fives, and you get very few ones and twos because the probabilities are very low compared to, uh, for example, the probability of getting a, a three here, which is 0.4, okay? So I find it quite useful sometimes to just try and simulate uh, stuff from, uh, from a distribution just to, to better understand what it does, okay? So it generates ones, twos, and threes depending on the number of probabilities you, you put in the vector of probabilities here. Okay, how to code this model? So we started with a, a model with one winter. Now we have five winters and we have this dynamic of states. We don't have any uh, detection issue for the moment. It, it will come uh, uh, in a minute, but uh, let's try to write down uh, what that done in, in Nimble. So again, we use this function Nimble code to, um, to, to write down the model. Let's get, let's get rid of the, the prior because it's kind of a, the same as before. It's a uniform distribution between zero and one. So phi is distributed as a uniform distribution between zero and one, that's the prior. Then we define our transition matrix. So it's a, a two by two a table or matrix. And the first row, first column is phi. So between brackets, we say first row, first column, first row, Second column is the mortality, one minus five. And second row, first column is uh, uh, the probability of being uh, alive at t given that you were dead at t minus one. So it's zero, you cannot be in that state. And the probability of remaining dead given that you were dead at the previous occasion is one, okay, it's a certain. And then we have the probability of initial states we saw that uh, we assume that everybody is released, uh, all animals are released alive. So uh, the probability of being alive at the first sampling occasion is one and zero of being dead. And then, and then we go through a loop uh, over all individuals, the N individuals. We, we start by uh, saying that at the first sampling occasion, the initial states, are distributed as 
a multinomial distribution or a categorical distribution with probabilities the delta, okay, the deltas. So in our case, it's one and zeros, but like I said, we will need to be uh, this vector to get a bit more complex for a more complex example that will come uh, later on. And then we go through the next uh, winter uh, occasions or sampling occasion. We go from two up to the last sampling occasion, T. And we say, okay, the state, uh, your state at the next sampling occasion is uh, distributed as a categorical distribution with parameters. So what's this parameter? It's so you get, you see, that's the matrix gamma, the two by two matrix that we defined earlier here. And we say, okay, you take the two columns and you get the row that corresponds to the state of the individual at T minus one, okay? So if the individual was alive, so it's a one, you take the first row. And if the individual was dead, you take the second row. So it's exactly what I described here, sorry, when I said, okay, depending, if you're alive, you take the first row, that's a one. If you're dead, you take the second row, uh, it's a two, okay? And you take the two columns each time. So that's exactly what, what this, this line in the code here is doing. Okay? You pick the row that corresponds to the state at T minus one. So as I said, this vector delta is used as a placeholder for more complex models to come. Here we could write just uh, uh, that at uh, first sampling occasion for all individuals, uh, your state is alive. So it's a one. Okay. okay, I will skip that one. Um, uh, yeah, a few comments on the converting to nimble when you coming from JAGs, open bugs or wind bugs. The main difference uh, and something that we always forget when we come from uh, JAGs, open bugs and wind bugs and which is the cause of some, uh, um, like you cannot run the model, but it's easy to fix. The main difference is that nimble does not guess. So you, you have to specify the dimensions of vectors and matrices. So you cannot write X, X sorry, uh, and bracket, brackets with an empty, uh, empty, uh, empty space here, or just X and you let wind bugs or open bugs, or in the case nimble, guess the columns you want to pick here. You have to provide the, the ranges, the ranges for the index. So here X, I would, I would have to write it one up to N. And if I, I want to get all the columns for, for X, for this metric X, I would have to write uh, one up to M, okay? And there are more, more tips here. If you click on that, you'll get uh, more tips in the in the Nibble manual. But that's that's mostly the, the well, that's the most important uh, probably uh, difference between uh, uh, JAGS, OpenBugs, WingBugs, and Nibble. Okay, the constants, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, go on with the code. Uh, constants and data here, we have the constants is just the number of individuals we released and the number of sampling occasions, the number of winters. Okay, so this is the, 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 the index of the loop, the, yeah. And the data is just the number of survive, the, the table with the uh, ones and twos to say uh, uh, whether you were alive or dead. Initial values, that's the same function as before. And you see that you don't simulate the same value. It was 56 in the previous example. Here it's 35, huh? it's random. Parameters to save, it's the same vector, phi. MCMC details, so we have two chains, 5,000 iterations minus the number of uh, uh, burning iterations, 1,000. And then we run, we run Nimble, okay? Again, we can... Uh, we can uh, have a look to the outputs. Here, survival is 0.81. <clears throat> the posterior mean and median are very close. The median here is 50%, here is 0.81, which is the uh, same thing as posterior mean, right? And that's cool because the data was simulated. Huh? Uh, the true survival was actually uh, 0.8. So we get back what we, uh, we put to simulate the data. 
Okay, um, so there is a live demo uh, for that one, but my proposal, because the time is running, yeah. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna keep the live demo for the HMM, for the hidden market process. That one, you have it, uh, we'll go through it very quickly at the end of the, of the lecture. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go straight to the, um, uh, to the hidden Markov model, and we'll have the, the 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 live demo at the end. So, as you might have guessed, um, unfortunately, the data this is the data we wish we had. Okay, uh, we have a perfect observation of whether an individual was dead or alive. In real life, animals cannot be monitored exhaustively, uh, like humans in a medical trial. They are captured, marked, or identified, then released and alive. Or dead, also. Then these animals may be detected again or go undetected, and that's why we have a capture recapture data. That's what we call capture recapture. And whenever animals go undetected, it may be that they were alive but missed, or because they were actually dead and therefore they couldn't be detected. So that's the issue of imperfect detection. Okay. And uh, um, yeah, okay. That's the slide to illustrate hidden Markov model. Uh, some say that uh, that uh, hidden Markov models were introduced to, uh, uh, well, have been used or are used to guide satellites, where you have uh, the position of a satellite is the true uh, state. Okay, but when the position is sent back to Earth, uh, they came with some error. So these are the observations. The detection and the detections are the observations. The the position of the satellites that are sent back to Earth, and the true position of the satellite are the state alive or dead in our survival example, okay? Okay, so the truth is in Z. Z. <clears throat> That's what we had before. Unfortunately, we have only partial access to Z, okay, in true life. We do observe uh, Y, detections and non-detections. How are uh, the two connected? Well, Dead animals uh, go undetected, and you cannot detect uh, dead animals. So when an animal is dead, that is, Z is true, it cannot be detected. So we have Y is zero, okay, zero for non-detected. So in our table, we're gonna replace all the twos by zeros, right? So all the twos have been replaced by zeros. And before the first detection, we know nothing, and we proceed conditional on it. Okay, so in our case, everybody was released on the, uh, at the first uh, sampling occasions, but that's okay. So we just uh, we just put put NAs here. So that's what we observe in real life. Okay, this is what we call uh, these are the observations, the detections and non detections. So if you are alive, uh, so if it's a one, you detected one with probability p or you're not detecting a zero with probability one minus p right so you have the detection probability that uh, appears now and we'll need another table or matrix to link the states to the observations so the z to the y so the alive and dead to the non-detected and detected so that's what we do with the observation matrix so we pack everything, the observation probabilities, the p's, uh, in an observation matrix called uh, big omega, yeah, that one. In rows, we're gonna have the states alive and dead, okay? Ones and twos. In columns, the observation, non-detected, uh, ones and uh, twos. Okay, so I, I switched to ones and twos, so I just added one to, uh, the observations, which were non-detected zero and detected one. It's just uh, uh, more convenient for Nimble or Jags or the software you use. It's easier to use. It doesn't like zeros. Uh, when you index stuff with zeros, it doesn't work. So you have to start with ones or uh, at, at, at once, at one. So let's say non-detected is one, uh, so zero plus one, and detected is two, one plus one. Uh, which we coded uh, zero and one with uh, previously. Okay, and so we define this big omega matrix uh, like this way. So if you were 
hang on, there is, yeah, this is where, where I want it to go. So at T, if you're alive, then at the same sampling occasion at T, huh, it, it, everything happens on the same sampling occasion. You can be non-detected with probability one and minus P or detected with probability P, okay? Again, in rows, you have the states and in columns, you have the observations, non-detected and detected. Now, if you're dead, that's the second row, row two, okay? If you're dead, you are non-detected with probability one and detected with probability zero, okay? So let's get back to our uh, graphical representation of the Markov model. Remember, we had the states here that uh, went from uh, uh, one sampling occasion to the other, okay? And now what we observe are the detections and non-detections in white here. So we don't have access to the Z unless uh, an individual is observed, but when an individual is missed, we don't know its state, okay? So the observations are emitted. Sometimes we say that in the HMM uh, uh, terminology, the observations, the detection and detections are emitted from the states, okay? So that's why we have the arrow going from the states to the observations. And everything happens at the same sampling occasion, whereas for the state, you have a dynamic here from T minus one to T. And the parameters that drive this dynamic, you have the probabilities of detections or non-detections to link the states to the uh, observations, P's and one minus P's, and the five probability, the survival probabilities that, uh, that uh, drive the dynamic of the states, okay? The survival and mortality like we saw before. That's your HMM, that's your hidden Markov model for survival. So the states are in gray, again, alive is one and dead is two, and the observations in white, uh, non-detected it's a one and detected is a two, okay? And, you, and of course, when you are dead here, a two, the state, you cannot be detected, so it's a one for sure, with probability one. Okay, what's the likelihood of HMM? The thing here is that we don't know the states. So, okay, it's a bit ugly, but don't have a look uh, straight to the formula. Uh, so we have to go through all the possibilities because the states are, are, are not known, okay? The Z are not known now because we don't observe them uh, uh, perfectly because of the imperfect detection issue. Okay, so we have to sum over all the possibilities, all the states. So that's why we have these sums here. Now the likelihood is the probability of the Ys, huh? of the detection and non-detections. And so you have the, the sum over all the Zs here, and then you condition on the, the states. So you have, <coughs> sorry, the, the base formula saying the probability of the observations are conditional on the states times the probability of the states, and you sum over all the possibilities, all the states, okay? And if you do that, you can recognize this here, the probability of the Z. So we, we already uh, worked that out. It's the probability of the initial states time, the transition probabilities. That's what we did before for the Markov process uh, without any uh, detection issue. And then here, the probability of the Ys given the Z, because we have independence between the Ys, uh, conditional on the Z, uh, that's the probability of the omegas, the observation probabilities, okay, the, the elements of the big omega matrix. So we have all these sums, the products and the products again. So that's very ugly. Huh? It has a matrix formulation, but we, we won't uh, use it. Actually. So the question is, uh, shall we estimate the latent states or not? The fact that an individual is alive or dead, in the previous example, we got rid of the states in the formula here. This one is just a function of the P's, the probability of detections, and a function of the, the, the survival probabilities, okay, the, the phi's. We don't have the Z anymore. And here, the probability of initial states, it's one and zeros in our case. So we, we got rid of the states by summing over, over all the possibilities. And that's the function we would maximize in a frequency approach with the maximum likelihood uh, approach, okay? The Bayesian approach with MCMC methods allows you to treat uh, the latent states 
as if they were parameters. And, and uh, to estimate these uh, latent states, this Z, the fact that you're alive or dead, as parameters. Okay, so you can estimate those latent variables as if they were parameters like the survival or detection probabilities. And inferring the latent states, the Z, can be very useful to estimate, for example, prevalence uh, in animal epidemiology, like we will see in, a, in, a, in, the, in another session. In evolutionary ecology, uh, when you want to estimate sex ratio and you don't have the sex for all individuals. In conservation biology, when you want to estimate the prevalence of hybrids and uh, you have states for individuals, okay, and you want to uh, say uh, whether you were alive as a hybrid or as a uh, non-hybrid and, and so on. So inferring the latent states, the Z is very useful. But it's costly. And uh, if you don't need to do it to estimate the latent state, uh, you can get rid of them by, like we, we did in the previous slide, by what we call a, a process we call marginalization. And uh, that could speed up computations. It doesn't work all the time, but uh, generally uh, it speed up comp computations. And you can estimate the states afterwards, actually. You can uh, decode the states afterwards. We won't go into these details. I'll just give you this reference by uh, uh, Yakulic uh, in, in 2020, which is a very nice paper if you if you get interested in uh, in estimating states in uh, capture, recapture, or occupancy models. Check out this uh, paper. It's a very uh, nice paper. OK, the cool thing is that Nimble provides marginalized models, so where you get rid of the, the states through this package called Nimble Ecology, and we'll get back to it uh, later on. OK, the model is uh, that one. So for the initial states, we have a categorical or multinomial uh, distribution with parameter delta. For the dynamic of the states, it's again a multinomial or categorical distribution with uh, this vector of probabilities uh, gammas. And for the observation now, given the states at the same sampling occasion, it's also a multinomial distribution with the uh, observation probabilities, the omegas, okay? So the rows of the, of the observation matrix. And for the priors, for phi and for p, the detection probability, well, we'll, we'll just choose for now um, uniform distribution between zero and one or beta distribution. Okay, nimble. So maybe I will switch directly to the to the live demo. Yeah, I think that's what. Yeah, that was that was uh, the end of the. So I'm gonna go through uh, the live demo directly. So let me. Uh, let me um, let me go to the live demo. Okay. Live demo. Okay, I'm opening our studio. Oh. Huh. Yeah, okay. I'm going to increase the font size. Can you see it? Yeah. Anyone? Can you see my uh, R Studio? Uh... Yeah, yes. it's okay. okay. It's Thank you very much. Okay, so you can find the. Uh... Hang on, because I maybe you missed it. You can find that on the website. Huh? Okay. Oops. Okay. So. Yeah, it's working. Okay, so that's the live demo. Uh, so you have the lines. I didn't have time to go through the first live demo. It's just, uh, you know, the this example with one winter. So you have the code, you have everything here. You can run it uh, on your own if you want. Let's go straight to the HMM. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. What time is it? Oh, it's 10 already. Okay. So I'm going to take five minutes huh, to go through the 
this example. Okay, where is it? I need to run. Hang on, yeah. Okay, I need to run the the because I simulate data to um, to illustrate the 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 hidden Markov model example. So so we have fifty seven individuals, five winters, right? Then we define this uh, vector of, uh, we say that everybody is released at the first sampling occasion. So we have this vector first that we will use in the, in the code. Huh? Survival is 0, 0 0.8, 80%. And we define the Z matrix that we're gonna uh, feed with some simulations, okay? So we actually simulate data. So it's a good way to understand better how the, the model uh, works. Huh? You just use the model, instead of using the model to estimate parameter, you use it to simulate data. So we go through all the individual, uh, we go through, uh, through a loop of uh, all individuals. At first sampling occasion, the state is uh, alive, so one. And then you go through uh, all the subsequent uh, time occasions, uh, sampling occasions. So from first one plus one, so two up to uh, five, the number of occasions. And you say, okay, the state, for this particular individual, I at time t is a binomial is a binomially distributed um, with probability phi times the uh, the fact that you're alive or dead at the previous occasion. Okay, so if you do that, and then we replace all the zeros by twos for for dead. Okay, that's what we said. So then you get this uh, table. That's the one I showed you in the in the in the lecture. Okay. We put some names. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Now HMN. So we define uh, the probability of detection. Let's say it's sixty percent, and uh, we replace all the deads by zeros. Uh, all dead individuals cannot be detected. Okay, and then for individuals that are alive, we uh, we apply the observation process and we say, okay, uh, you observed or not with probability p. Okay, so these are just uh, we don't need to worry about that. It's just uh, a few lines I need to um, clean up the data, but that's how I simulate data, and. Here we go. These are our um, data, detections and non-detections. So you see non-detections are zeros and detections are ones. Okay, now the code for the HNN. So we have priors for survival and detection probabilities. So we just uh, write that down. Uh, uniform distribution between zero and one. And then we have the likelihood. So for the likelihood, we have the gamma matrix or table is just the transition probabilities like before, like in the Markov process example, without any detection issue. Okay, so we say uh, we fill in gamma with five probabilities and now the delta, the probability of initial states. So like before we said, okay, everybody is alive. All animals are alive at first sampling occasion. So it's a one the probability of being alive is one. And then the new thing, the, the novelty is this observation matrix where we say, okay, the first row is for alive and the columns are for non-detected and detected. Okay, so if you're alive, uh, you're detected with probability, you're non-detected with probability one minus P, the probability of being missed. If you're alive, you detected the second column with probability P. And now the second row, if you're dead, you undetected with probability one and you're detected with probability zero. Okay, you cannot be detected. And then like before, you go through a loop for all individuals. And then uh, you just uh, uh, sort out the case for first winter and you say, well, you just throw a coin and you say you're alive or dead with probability one and zero. So if you for sure you're alive at first sampling occasion. So that's what, this uh, line is telling you, we should just, uh, we could use just uh, 
um, uh, we could just say that Z for individual I at first sampling occasion is one, but like I said, it's a placeholder and we will use it uh, uh, this way in more complex examples uh, later on. So it's cool to get familiar with that now. So it's a distribution, but that could be fixed. Huh? And then we go through um, the, the next uh, sampling occasions from two to T and we say, okay, we say first, okay, um, the, the state in the, in the next, at the next sampling occasion, given the state you were at the previous sampling occasion is a multinomial distribution with a one trial or categorical distribution. That's what we saw before. And we pick the row in the transition matrix gamma corresponding to the state you were at previous sampling occasion. So that's this one, J minus one. Okay. So it's going to be one or two. If you were alive at the previous sample occasion, it's going to be the first row, one. And if you're dead, they're going to be the, that's going to be the second row, two. Okay. And you take both columns. And so it's going to pick, uh, it's going to throw a coin, uh, and get the outcome depending on the, the vector corresponding to the first or second row of gamma. And then once your state is known, you can emit the observation, you can get an observation uh, using the observation matrix, the omega, the big omega matrix. And, it and you, you pick the row corresponding to your current state, either it's alive or dead. And then you, uh, you pick the, the two columns corresponding to that row, okay? Okay, so let's... Uh, Oh yeah, I forgot to to load the number. That's uh, fortunate. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's a function, an R function, basically. Uh, <coughs> it looks like an R function. The constants. So now we need the number of individuals, uh, the number of sampling occasions, and this vector of uh, uh, the, the the occasions of first capture. Okay, so that's a list huh, with three components. And the data are just the matrix of uh, detections, non-detections. So I I add one to all the cells of this table because I want ones and twos, like I said. I generate init's initial value, so you can have a look at how I, I just uh, use the observation table uh, and I, uh, I just make sure that uh, um, all individuals are, are alive. Initial values. Now we need initial values for the survival and the detection probabilities and for the states. Okay. The parameters to save, survival and detection. Number of iterations, burning, chains, and then we run the code. Right. So it goes through uh, several steps that we will explain later on. Huh? Um, compilation, some verifications. Okay, I could skip, but I didn't know. And uh, yeah, and then we will have a look to the results using this uh, package, package uh, MCMCVs. Wait a minute. Okay, you see first chain, second chain, and you're done. And here we go. The probability of detection is estimated at 70% and the survival probability is 83. So the detection probability is a bit far from uh, 0.6. I think we used the 0.6 in the simulations, uh, but that's one simulation. You should run it uh, several times to, to make sure that uh, you're on track. And the survival is 0 0.8 for 0 0.8, I think. And here we go. That's how you, and this simple, HMM is actually the core max Julie model with constant parameter. You have a survival is constant and detection is constant. So that's what we call the core max Julie model in the capture recapture terminology from the name of the, of the researchers who uh, developed this model, core max Julie and Siba. And here we go. I think uh, that's all for this session. 
Uh, okay, that was a big long because we had to introduce Nimble as well. So maybe we can take, a, I don't know, a 10 minute break. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me or are you all? Uh... Yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's get Sorry. back at, uh, yeah, Daniel. Maybe I lost you, I hope it was, maybe I can hear you now, sir. Okay, let's get back in 10 minutes. Let's resume in 10 minutes. Okay, see you. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, see you. <clears throat> Okay, um, welcome back everybody. Um, I think it's been about 10 minutes right now, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, of course, Olivier, uh, for the first introduction to HMMs, um, which is, as he said, a uh, difficult uh, concept to get, get your head around at first if you haven't seen them before. And we're going to take that uh, to the next level right now, where we get into more complex um, versions of HMMs with more states and more complicated transition matrices. So let me go ahead and do the same thing and try and share the slides here. I think everyone can see my screen now. I'm gonna move some of these Zoom things. Great, awesome, thank you for that, I appreciate it the zoom things out of the way the toolbars are always in the way okay so um transition estimation like i said we're going to look at some more complicated um hmm models now and also uh some live demos as well so what can we do with these um we're going to look at uh, in particular multi-site and multi-state models um in this session and this paper right here um 1973 and also the following one here, um, decades later, 1993, were actually the first uh, people to formulate these sort of multi-site HMM models um, in the context of capture recapture. Multi-site means uh, where there's transitions between different locations, different sites, um, animals moving between them. And that's what we'll look at uh, today, which can nicely lend themselves to the HMM formulation. And then subsequently, just shortly after, uh, to the general again the multi-state rules where we have different states for individuals. Um, individuals can be breeding or non-breeding or juveniles and age states or a variety of other things. So, so representing individuals. We'll talk about both of these. Um, yeah, so the first example we're gonna look at is like I said with sites, multi-sites with um, the Canadian geese data set, which is a good one actually we'll look at. Um, we've looked at this extensively and it's a great data set. So geese moving between different sites. Um, specifically, this is in the um, Atlantic coast of the United States, actually near where I grew up, um, central eastern US, and a large data set, and this is important, it's relevant later, 
21,000 uh, banded geese, uniquely identifiable geese, which is a huge number moving between uh, different sites. The full data set has three different sites along the US Eastern seaboard. And that's what you see in this matrix here where the rows represent different individual geese, 21,000 rows of geese, and the columns represent years, as you can see. And we see a bunch of zeros, ones, twos, and threes. And what this means, there are three states. The ones, twos, and threes mean uh, a particular goose was observed at a particular site, number one, two, or three. So for example, this first row right here means that this goose was not observed in the first year, 1984, then was observed at site number two in the subsequent two years, and then not observed thereafter. So we have a bunch of uncertainty here. The only thing we know for sure is that this goose was in site two these two years. Where was it here in 1987? Was it in site two? Did it move to site one or three? We don't know. All we know is we didn't see it, or perhaps also um, it passed away and the goose was no longer with us. So we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty in what happened here, and we're gonna be interested in uh, survival, um, potentially at different sites. Maybe there's different survival rates at different sites. Uh, transition rates between sites, you know, the probabilities of these geese moving between sites, and also the observation probabilities, the detections, how likely we are to detect it. If this goose was still at site two, we didn't see it. So what's the probability of detection there? And all these things, the survival, transition, and detection, all lend themselves perfectly into this HMM framework, which is what we're going to talk about. So with that as the data, we need to think about um, the observations that can take place. Um, and also to simplify it first, I should mention, uh, the first look at this, we're going to just assume there are two states, uh, excuse me, two different sites rather than three, um, A and B, and then we'll generalize this to the full three sites. Uh, so these are the things that can actually happen, the observations on the left. We don't see a goose or we see it in site A and we see it in site B. And one way to think about this, well, perhaps we might think of first, is understanding and thinking that, well, if a goose is, for example, in site A, then if we see it in site A, then that means assuredly it's alive in site A. And we, we realize that if this is the observation, then certainly it was alive in site A. Similarly for a detection in site B. If the data says we saw it in site B, then certainly it's alive in state B. And if there's a non-detection, a zero, then actually it could be any of these and we're not certain it was alive in either site and it wasn't detected or perhaps the goose was dead. So we might think of it this way, but again, with the HMM framework, we want to think about it in the opposite direction uh, of what's shown right here, where we first think about the states and then think about what observations might occur. So here we just switch those two columns and we have the different states. And the question is, which observation can occur from each state? And this is how you want to think about it. And specifically, if a goose is dead, then this is the only thing that's for sure. If it's dead, we won't observe it. No question about that. However, if a goose is in site A, it either might be a non-detection if we don't observe it or a detection in site A. And similarly for site B, it might be a non-detection or detecting it in site B. So what we want to do is think about these transitions in this direction from the latent states to the observations and the probabilities associated with each of those. So um, to formulate this as an HMM, we're once again going to need these two uh, matrices, the transition matrix, and the observation matrix. Uh, here, the transition matrix, uh, once again, denoted as gamma. And the thing to think here is look at each row individually where the individual was on the previous observation time period, T minus one. So if a goose was at T minus one in site A, then where is it going to be? We want to look at this whole row and consider where is it going to be in the next time period, uh, time period T. And this matrix contains those probabilities. And we denote the survival if you're in site A as phi A, and the transition probabilities if you're in site A as probability of moving from site A to site B as psi AB from A to B. So logically, uh, if you're alive in site A, one minus the probability of survival gives the probability that you're going to be dead in the next time period. Assuming you don't die, assuming you survive, so that's phi A, if you're in site A in the previous time period, what's the probability of site B? Well, it's the probability that you survive times the probability of making this transition, psi AB. And similarly, the probability that you're in site A again in the next time period is once again the probability that you survive 
times one minus this transition probability. And importantly, one should realize that if you add across any of these rows, you necessarily get one. That being, if you're in site A in the last time period, there's three different things that could happen. And the probability of those three things, these three probabilities must sum to one. And it's a small exercise in just adding these together and getting one. The same thing holds, I won't go through it in detail either. Um, but if you're in site B, where you can be in the next time period, where we have survival in site B as phi B, and this transition probability from site B to site A as psi B A. Once again, these sum to one. And then here is if you're dead in the previous time period, uh, there, there's no coming back to life, you're guaranteed to be dead in the next time period. So this is our transition matrix. And we note there are four parameters here, the two phi parameters and the two psi parameters. So yeah, we'll formulate this as a three by three transition matrix in the model. Uh, the three latent states, the three Zs, you're in site A, site B, or you're dead. And there's three possible observations here coded as zero, one, and two for the Y. The data actually was, as we saw, zero is no observation. One meant you're in site A and two meant you're in site B. And once again, look at the rows. That's how we want to consider this. If you're in site A on a time period, ZT is equal to A, what's the probability of each of these three uh, observations? Well, if you're in site A, there's no chance, there's a zero chance of us observing you in site B, just can't happen. There's a PA probability of detection in site A, chance of detecting you in site A, where you are, and one minus PA of a non-detection. So here in this model, we assume there's different probabilities of detection between site A and site B with these two parameters. Um, that's just a choice we made. We could have used one probability detection, but here we have two. And for site B, more obviously that summing across these rows necessarily gives one. We need that to be the case. And if you are dead on a particular time period, then the probability of non-detection is one and the probability of detection in either site is of course zero. So there's our, our observation matrix omega. And these two things, the gamma matrix, the transition matrix and omega are the ingredients of this HMM. And if you can write this um, in the model code, then you can formulate this model and have a multi-site model with geese moving between different sites. So um, you can code, this just says the non-detections as y equals two, you can. In this case, the non-detections are in the data set code is zero. You can in fact code these however you want. You know, anything zero, one or two can represent any of these. It would just mean permuting the different columns of these. Different people have different um, standards or, or things they like to apply with the the zero, the non-detection state being the first one or the last one. It's usually not in the middle. That's the truth. Non-detection is it's usually the first or the last. But however the data is, you know, anything would work as long as you formulate this matrix appropriately and think through it as we've done right here. Uh, what does the model look like? Here is uh, the model code for this. Once again, um, we use the nimble code function. And here we define nicely in comments the parameters, phi a, phi b the two psi terms and the two probabilities of detection, and also define these states. Here we use the states rather than A, B, and D. We use numerical values as we need. One alive at A, two alive at B, three dead. Everyone keep this straight because note here that being alive at A is latent state Z equals one, but being seen at A is observation Y equals two. And the not seen, the unobserved state is in fact Y equals one. So this can get a little bit tricky. Um, I might make mess it up myself, um, but this does allow us, you'll see, using this to actually define the first observation uh, easily. This is a nice trick we can do uh, because of these definitions right here. So this is just comments uh, in the code. Then uh, following that, the, in the model code, we have prior distributions for each of these terms. They're all probabilities, survival probability in A, survival in B, transition from A to B, transition from B to A, and the two probabilities of detection. So we give them all uniform not one priors. As Olivier said, these could all just as well be beta one one priors, same thing. Um, so here we just use the uniform distribution saying totally uninformative about each of those. So we have six parameters right here that we're looking at. Uh, these are the prior distributions for the parameters. The next thing are formulating ah, the initial state probabilities in this first formulation, we have the probability of an initial detection, an observation being in state A, which we call pi A, 
and the initial detection being in state B as one minus that. And the initial detection, the prior probability of the initial detection being dead can't be the case. For the first detection, uh, there's no chance that an individual is actually dead. So we have this delta matrix, which we'll use as the prior probability for the first detection. Although, as we see, we don't actually need this in the model. So this is the initial state probabilities using one more parameter called pi A. Um, since the initial state is known exactly, those the first detection, the first time we see an individual, we see it in site A or B, we know exactly where it is. Uh, we don't actually need this term and the posterior distribution of this will end up just being the, the proportion of the individuals first seen in site A is what will happen with this model. Uh, rather than using this, as I said, instead what we can do, rather than giving a prior distribution, uh, Right here, this is using the deltas, the prior distribution for each individual, its first observation. Instead, we can use the, use the of the, the observation one in corresponds to a two. Um, Z equals one corresponds to Y equals two, a little confusing, but we can hard code. Note this is not a stochastic declaration. This is now a deterministic arrow. And we're doing assignment saying the value of Z on the first observation is equal to, it gets the Y minus one. So what does this two, when, when Y is equal to two, for example, so track one from two and you get one, and that says the latent state corresponding to that is Z equals one, which is site uh, A. Similarly, when y is equal to one, which corresponded to uh, site A, subtract one from that and you get uh, zero. I think I might be mixing this up, like I said, but this works out. If you go back to the definitions of the observations, y's and the states, z, this works uh, correctly for the observations in sites A or B, specifying the first latent state has to be alive in A or alive in B. So it's a, it's a trick. It, it uh, loosens up the, or actually makes the model more specific relative to the data and alleviates some of the sampling, the uncertainty in the model. And no, we don't need this pi A parameter either. So we'll see this in the model code. Um, so as far as these matrices, the gamma and omega matrices, the gamma matrix was the transition matrix. And this is just assigning into the elements of this matrix, the one, one element, as exactly as we saw before, phi A times one minus the psi term, the second element in that row and the third element in that row. Similarly, for the second row of this, I'm not gonna go through all this again, but this is exactly um, in code, in model code, defining that gamma matrix exactly as we talked through. And the final row of that saying uh, the transitions between if you're dead, this is the third row, you cannot in the next time period exist in state one or two, which is alive but you must necessarily be dead in the next state. So again, if you think of this, um, it, it makes it clear right here, uh, you know, the gamma elements being the current state you're in, comma, the next state you're in right there. So this is just the model code for that transition matrix. The observation matrix, this is exactly the same um, as before, where each of these are the rows of the, uh, Omega, the transition matrix, if you're alive in state A, then you can be non-detected with probably one minus PA, detected at site A with probably PA. And if you're alive in A, the probability being detected at B is in fact zero. And I will just point out, uh, apologies, I do believe, I think this is a typo in this line right here, if that's confusing anyone. I think this should read omega of Z of T comma y of t, the first index references state observation. And similarly here, this should read state comma observation right there. So everyone catch that, um, the order of these and these should be switched. But this just implements that observation matrix omega as we saw before. And finally, the likelihood, we get back to the same thing we saw. We've seen all the components of this. Um, index, the index I goes over individuals for each individual. We hard code the first latent state. The first observation of each individual is set as the observation data, the Y value uh, minus one, uh, as we talked about. Um, and actually, I think this also requires, okay, the indexing should work on that uh, if, if you think through the logic of that. And then for the transitions, we now model 
for the for t going from the first observation plus one, so the second observation, all the way through the number of observation periods. Well, here, if you think about the indexing carefully, it's the gamma matrix where the two indices are the latent state value of the previous time period that gives the row. Each row of the gamma matrix talks about the previous state and then use all the columns of it, columns one, two, and three. So we're doing a categorical distribution, a draw from this with the probabilities given by this row of the gamma matrix. So it takes a second of thinking to get your head around, but the previous Z value, Z, gives some row, the first, second, or third row of this transition matrix. All the elements in that row give the probabilities of the categorical distribution. And this is saying the distribution for the next time period is a categorical draw given those probabilities. So this defines the state transitions from ZT minus one to ZT. And similarly here, another categorical distribution for the observation matrix using the exact same thing. Z, the current ZT, this row of the omega matrix and all three columns of it, one through three. So this gives three probabilities, one row of omega, are the probabilities given to this categorical distribution saying that y, which is the data, um, whether it was not observed or observed in site A or in site B, follows a categorical distribution given those probabilities. So this, this is uh, the likelihood. The z's will represent uh, unknown latent states. Those will undergo MCMC sampling, and they'll flip-flop around between zeros and ones and twos, uh, or actually ones, twos, and threes. Uh, given according to these probabilities. And then this determines, uh, restricts the Zs in some sense and contributes to the likelihood, how likely each of these are, uh, the observations given different values of Z um, and will infer all the parameters. So there's a lot there, but but fundamentally, this is very similar to the HMMs Olivier showed us earlier. It's just now a three by three space of states and possible observations. So, with that, we can fit this model, and we will look at this in the demo afterwards, but we obtain um, posterior estimates. This is all the same things, posterior means, uh, credible intervals, R hat and the effective sample size, things we might note are probabilities of detection in each site are perhaps you know about a half or 0.4, um, seems more likely for detections in site A. Survival in the two sites, 0.6 and about 0.7, seems slightly perhaps more likely higher survival potentially in site B. And then transition probabilities, we can make some inferences here about the likelihood of transitioning from site A to B versus that from B to A, which is significantly less likely. So here are our inferences for these parameters. Um, yeah, here again from the MCMC, all these parameters must exist between naught and one. And we can kind of see this, the uncertainty. It's a little easier to see here relative to the numerical summaries about detection probabilities, survival right here. Again, survival in site B, arguably a little bit higher. And the psi AB and psi BA are the transitions. And we note once again that individuals are much, much less likely to transition from site B to site A. So we've made reasonable inferences here about all these survival, detection, and transition between these sites. And noting also with such a large um, data set, you know, there's a lot of power here for these inferences. So reasonably tight credible intervals, if you look at all of these. So this was two sites. And the question is now, what if there are three sites? And, and you might initially say, oh, no problem. Just, you know, bump up the dimension, you know, by one instead of two sites have three, everything's a four by four matrix now, no big deal. But it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, to be when we only had two sites so the survival and the detection probabilities those will be fine survival at each site no problem detection no problem but the transitions are what's going to be tricky because when there were two sites we only had transi transitions from a to b and b to a those two site transitions and it was easy so it was easy to find one psi parameter for transitioning from a to b and the inverse of that was just one minus that for going the opposite direction but now we're going to have actually for each site uh, three different transition probabilities. If you're in site A, going from site A to B, or from A to C, or staying in site A, the self transition from A to A. So we're going to have three probabilities, which all need to be between zero and one and need to sum to one. So it's a little more tricky. 
So again, the three transition probabilities uh, from each site, and there's three sets of these, if you're in site A, B, or C, all need to sum to one. So we'll see this when we look at the model, but um, there's a bunch more probabilities in that constraint, specifically the sum of the three probabilities uh, being one is more tricky. So that's, that's the difficulty here in this uh, three site, multi-site model. There's two different ways you can go about this. Both have advantages and disadvantages. One is using a Dirichlet prior, which is the, the multi-dimensional generalization of the beta prior. Uh, we can talk about that. And the second is using a multinomial logit uh, link, which is the generalization of a logistic function or logistic regression. If you're familiar with this, this is multinomial logistic regression. So those are the two approaches and you need to use one of them. Um, we'll look at both of them. What the Dirichlet prior does, um, let me just try and explain uh, briefly. If you think about the beta prior, go back and think about your beta one one for a probability of success. And actually what was happening there, you know, behind the scenes is when you find a beta prior for some probability, say P, you give two parameters. But also implicit there is it also was defining the, the, the final probability which is one minus P. There's actually two probabilities there, probability of success and probability of failure, P and one minus P. The Dirichlet prior generalizes that to more than two probabilities, say for example, three, and it takes a vector of not two probabilities, or not, not two values, but three values in this case. So the generalization of a beta one one is actually a, bit, is a, is a Dirichlet one 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 for three probabilities, which is totally uninformative. And this triangle here kind of tries to show us this prior distribution over three probabilities. Here we have a psi AA, a psi AB, and a psi AC. That is, if you're in site A, what are these three probabilities transitioning to site A, site B, or site C? And note that this is kind of uniform over the whole triangle. So again, a Dirichlet prior, Dirichlet 111, is the generalization of a beta 11. And it's uniform over this space of three parameters. And this is actually called, this, this shaker is called a simplex, which it's, it's, it's difficult to show here, but this is actually a triangle in three dimensional space. There, there's some better graphs you can look at it. But imagine in three space, a triangle connecting, uh, if you can think of this, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0, the unit vectors uh, in three space is what you want to be thinking about uh, when you look at this figure. Anyway, that aside, we can use other. Um, parameters for the Dirichlet prior, uh, Dirich, Dirichlet 1, 2, 2, which actually more heavily weights the second two of these. So note Psi AB and Psi AC, there's more prior density over here, and it's kind of uniform over Psi AA. That's corresponding to this one in the first position right there. The general rule of thumb is the larger the number in any of these three positions, the larger, the, higher, the more posterior you're putting on the values of that particular element of the Dirichlet prior. So here, a Dirichlet 248, note, for example, the third parameter, which is gonna be phi AC, and my zoom toolbar is blocking this here. I'm trying to move it, so you can see. Phi AC, this one right here, these lines has uh, much more prior density by larger values, whereas psi AA, for example, which is these over here, the horizontal ones, is more cl closer to uniform across this diagonal axis. It's a little bit hard to see. And finally, um, here for Dirichlet 555, five, five, this is saying it is still not uniform over this triangle, but it's, what's the word, symmetric in all three of the parameters, but it's much more likely to be near the center. So these plots kind of try and give some idea of what the Dirichlet prior is doing over three parameters, noting importantly that an uninformative Dirichlet prior would be a, a Dirichlet one one one, which is weird, uh, just uninformative over all three parameters. So how do you actually uh, do this? Well, it's, it's as simple as this. Here you go. Uh, for the three psi A parameters, this is transition from site A to site A, B, or C. This is a, a multivariate declaration for these three parameters from site A is a Dirichlet prior with Dirichlet, the, the alpha values are, alpha one, two, and three, which is not shown, but we're going to use for this vector alpha one, 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 which is that uninformative prior for all three. So this is strictly uninformative these parameters where looking at the second one, these three probabilities represent these, which is if you're in site B, 
they're probably transitioning to site A, a self transition to site B, or this uh, is a typo right here. This should read Psi BC. That should read right there from site B to site C. That's about this Dirichlet prior. Oh, and importantly, the Dirichlet prior is a prior for all three of these and all three of these will sum to one necessarily. It enforces that constraint because it's on that simplex in three space where anywhere on that triangle, if you if you thought about what I said or understood it, uh, all three of the coordinate axes on that triangle necessarily sum to one. So that's why it's useful. Okay, so this is one option for this, the transition probability, so Dirichlet prior. Um, this, this is the gamma matrix, the state transitions. This looks very similar to before. Note that for transitioning from state one to state one, two, or three, these first three rows is simply survival in state A times the probability of transitioning from site A to site A, from site A to site B, probability of site A to site C, these three elements of psi A, which had a Dirichlet prior, and then the probability of dying in state dead is one minus survival. And all of these are analogous right here, except your survival in state B and the psi B parameter, similarly right here, exactly the same thing. And this is the same as before as well. So this is this really looks exactly the same. The only tricky part was how to define the prior distributions on these transitions, psi C, one, two, and three. And we use the Dirichlet prior for this, this formulation. Okay. Um, there, everything else is the same, by the way. The observation matrix is not shown here. There would be three observation probabilities, PA, PB, PC, and you know some one minus PAs and PAs and stuff like that in it. Um, we'll see it when we look at the model code. And here it jumps right to the posterior inferences for this. And you know we can we could make some observations here. You're less likely for detections in site C and about transitions and such. You know if you're in site A, you're more than likely stay there. If you're in site B, you're quite likely to stay there. If you're in site C, you're quite likely to stay there, um, et cetera. But here are the posterior inferences and you know transitions, survival, and detection within each of the three states now. Uh, yeah, here's a plot looking at those. The other approach that we could use for this is a multinomial logistic regression. As I mentioned, the multinomial logit function. This is a little tricky. Um, if we have p sites or states, in this case, it's three. Uh, we specify prior distributions for all but one of the parameters, and that's on the logistic scale, the logit scale. And we'll do say a wide normal distribution. So on the logit scale, p minus one of those, so two of them in this case, are essentially flat. And then we generate the probabilities, the transition probabilities using this back transformation. And this, you might note right here, the inverse logistic function. The sum of the other ones. And if you have uh, two of these, two alphas, then you'll note that these terms right here, all necessarily, the betas are all end up between zero and one. And this is for P minus one of these. And then the final one, um, we're going to define the final one, beta three, as one minus the other betas shown right here. This is how the final probability is defined. And doing it in this manner gives flat priors uh, for all the alphas and gives us three probabilities as we need in this case, or a total of P probabilities, beta one, beta two, and beta three defined such, uh, all of which necessarily sum to one. And we can see that based on this right here, the final uh, constraint enforces that all the betas, the size, necessarily sum to one. So this is something else we required. So this is an alternate way of doing it. The advantage of doing it this way, uh, rather than the Dirichlet prior, is doing it with this, the multinomial logistic, uh, covariates into this. And the priors for the alphas, you can actually put uh, regression terms in these right here and incorporate site-specific covariates if you do it in this manner, which you can't easily do with the Dirichlet prior distribution. So this is an alternate way of doing it. Uh, here is congruence as we see these uh, normal, these broad, flat, normal prior distributions for the size, and this L psi means logit of psi A, logit of psi B, etc. Then here is the inverse logistic functions, the exponential function divided by one plus the exponential functions of the others, and finally defining the third, the psi A, B, and C, the third element as one minus the sum of the first two. 
So without spending too much time on the math here, like I said, this is the, the multinomial logistic function. Uh, we're defining these three transistor probabilities that sum to one. Uh, here's this one's the transistor using these, which looks exactly the same as before. There's nothing different here. The only thing that was different was the previous slide, how we defined the psi A, psi B, psi C, and the multinomial logistic. This right here should read multinomial logistic, same on the previous slide. Um, and once again, posterior inferences. You'll see these are extremely similar to what we had before. Not the not in fact the Dirichlet and this multinomial logistic. There is some information uh, conferred in those those normal priors, but they're qualitatively similar. And within Monte Carlo Air, the results will be the same as the Dirichlet prior that we saw before. Okay. So just to look at this and actually do some of this here, I think everyone can see this. Um, this is the goose model. What's gonna happen here? The R sessions on the right, right here. You know, there's R on the right, on the left you have the code. You can read in this goose data set and, you know, put it in Y and get some of it. In fact, um, here we have on the right, we can see some of these capture histories, um, you know, zeros, ones, twos, et cetera. We're going to, as we said, take away the y equals three observation and put this in a y2 matrix. This sets anything where the y is equal to the third, site equal to zero, and removes those observations from y2. So before we had the dimension of y was uh, 500 in wools, and now okay, it should be the same. The dimension will be the same. Well, we removed the ones. This removes ones with only zeros. So this new matrix without that third site, we have 417 individuals. This defines the first vector, the first observation of each. Um, you can look at that code if you want, but um, you know we need the first. Here's the multi-state model, as we saw, with only two sites. The priors, as we saw, exactly what we looked at. Uh, the gamma transition matrix right here is the code we saw before. Here's the delta um, with pi A. And also note there's a prob prior probability on pi A right here. Uh, omega, the observation matrix, and the categorical likelihood such. So this is the code for this. We just define that. Um, the data that we provide to the model is going to be this Y2 plus one. Why? Because the Y2 itself, Y2 had these zeros in it and we can't have zeros. What we need are um, ones, twos, and threes. The constants for the model require the first observation period, the number of individuals and the number of time periods. And then initial values for this takes a little work. Um, but we make a function, the Z initial values take a little effort and you know we won't. De detail that right now. Parameters to save, we'll look at all of these. And once again, the MCMC iterations, just to make this, uh, this one doesn't take too long, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna still shorten this a little bit just so we don't sit here for too, too long or something like this. Um, and here's the nimble MCMC function with any luck this works. Uh, and it goes through all the steps we saw before, defines the model, uh, initializes it, configures the MCMC, compilation, compilation takes just a little bit. And then we can look at the posterior inferences. But this is doing the same thing with this multi-state model right here, um, looking at the parameters. So yeah, um, what to say? This is just a generalization. This formulation, by the way, the one this one did not require either the Dirichlet or the multinomial priors because we only have two sites. Uh, but we'll look at that in just a second. The the next one down below and. Once this runs, we'll just we'll just see how this goes here. Um, it should compile in just a second. The one the compilation step here is where it is translating a model and the MCMC into C++ uh, code, and then it compiles that, which is why you need a C++ compiler installed. And that's the step that takes a second. If anyone works with C++ otherwise, uh, compiling anything always takes you know, in the direction of 30 seconds, at least uh, for compiling. But what you get for that is the speed benefit, um, much, 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 much faster uh, execution, significantly faster. If you try it later in the final module, we'll see the steps of this broken down a little bit more. And um, we'll note that the compilation is worth the extra time. Although 
it's certainly taking its time right now. Okay, so here go the chains, and this is indeed why uh, I shortened it a little bit. Uh, maybe could or should have done it more, but we have two chains of 5,000 iterations. One is about seconds or so. There's the first. There's the second. And then we can go ahead and use these functions and look at them. You know, the MCMC summary, here's the posterior summaries and MCMC plot. I'll, 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 I'll just, um, another one, basic MCMC plots, another package that we can use for similar. There's another option here if we do this, um, which is similar, but has a few different functionality chains plot of this, the multi-state model. Um, indeed shows us the chains and the posterior densities for each of the chains. And we can look at the sampling, the trace plots, and the parameters, and we could separate this. There's other options here, but it's reasonably similar to the MCMC viz uh, for the different chains and such. So look at these posterior inferences. For multi, um, this is similar, except just noting this is the multi-site. Uh, now, uh, well, this is this is the same. I think this uh, this is the one with without the. Uh, PA, the probability of detection. I'm going to skip this one right now, but this is the difference here is where we hard code the first observation Z. This would run faster and compile faster. It's a simpler model with uh, fewer samplers on everything. So that's worth having the code for. The final one we'll just look at briefly, and all the code is here. You guys have this. Um, I might stop after this, but here, in fact, the multinomial logistic prior for this. And this is exactly what we looked at before these flat normal priors for the size right here and the inverse logistic functions right here. So you could run this um, and it's worth looking at and having this code available. And also just having this uh, is an asset in the sense that you can generalize this for your own as uh, much as you'd like. So I'm gonna stop right there with the demo. We'll, we'll do a little bit more um, later. And here's the Dirichlet prior right here, the Dirichlet one, just so you're familiar with this, the same thing we looked at before. I'm going to continue on with this and just talk now instead of multi-site models, but states, a multi-state model. And this is an important distinction to think about because the, the applications here are quite different versus the multi-site animals moving between sites. But amazingly, the formulation of these models is going to be exactly the same as a hidden Markov model in HMM. So what do we mean by states? Uh, Multi-state models are where the state of an individual is not the location, but any sort of thing representing just that, what state the individual is in. Perhaps um, you know, health or sickness, uninfected, uninfected, recovered something from some disease, infected in some way for individuals, health, uh, size, or um, anything about the individual, growing, heavy, uh, height, et cetera, anything like that. Breeding states, uh, breeding, non-breeding, uh, failed breeder, first time breeder, et cetera. Any state the individual might be in. Uh, I've seen these a lot, the juvenile, the, um, as things progress through time, adult or juvenile adult in some sense. So life history or uh, social status in some one sense uh, where they're living with others, subordinate, et cetera. Um, so any sort of state of the individual. Um, once again, as we've seen, uh, death, alive or dead, but one is from harvest, where it was harvested, and for example, carcass was recovered, when it saw it recently died, for example. So there's all sorts of generalizations here for these multi state models about what state individuals can be in, not necessarily just location, physical site. This can represent, and just generally, the state of an individual is any categorical uh, individual specific covariate that might change over time, anything representing the state of an individual. And then we're going to model the transitions between these states and also the observations of these states in exactly the same manner as before. So the data set we'll look at here is the city shearwater um, uh, bird, as you see here. And there's um, a good data set representing here of this multi-state models um, representing the 
uh, breeding status of these individuals. And specifically, um, the original data set has a large number of these different um, breeding statuses. For example, active breeder or with another bird or alone or dead or not. So there's a number of different states considered in the original data set. We're going to uh, trim this down just a little bit for simplicity and actually just look at breeding status as breeders or non-breeders in a particular uh, time period. So we're gonna have two states, two observable states, B as birds who are breeding on a time period and NB as individuals who are non-breeding, which could represent before their breeding or failed breeders on a particular time period. So by doing so, having these two states, breeders and non-breeders, um, and then further for detections, we can either detect as non-breeders uh, and detections as breeders uh, and non-breeders. So there's a number of different observations that can take place here, but by doing it such with these two different states, um, we do can actually formulate this exactly the same as our previous model. So questions you might ask are, does breeding status affect survival? That's survival probability for breeders or non-breeders. And does breeding in a current year affect breeding in the next year? So that, that would be represented by the transition probability between the state of breeding in one year and the state of breeder or non-breeder status in the subsequent year. So you might be thinking that this feels very similar to our previous multi-site model, it's sites A and B. And now we have two different states individuals can be in, breeding and non-breeding. And the data looks something like this, where we have observations and non-observations, uh, but there'll be two different states for breeders and non-breeders. And here indeed is our uh, transition matrix, the gamma matrix, which again, should feel very similar to you where these transitions, uh, for example, psi B N B represents transition between a breeding state in one time period and non-breeding state in the next time period. And indeed these rows here represent in the previous time period, a breeder and a non-breeder for the second row. And the columns right here representing in the next time period, either breeding, not breeding, or in fact dead. So if you take a minute and just think about this, this is very similar to before, where we have two survivals, survival of breeders, survival of non-breeders, um, these transitions between breeding status and non-breeding, this psi term is transitioning from non-breeder to breeder. And those questions, the biological questions we might ask relating to future reproduction, this is asking the question, is the transition, self transition of breeding. If you breed in a previous year, your probability of transition to breeding in the next year, is that perhaps less than the probability of non-breeders breeding in the next year? If you think about what these two psi probabilities represent, this is asking the question of whether or not you're more likely to breed in a particular year if you didn't breed in the previous year. And then similarly for survival, the question is, are breeders less likely to survive? Is the survival rate of breeders smaller than that of non-breeders? So these are, these are potential questions we might ask with this model. The observation probabilities are such, uh, you know, we're probably detecting breeders as uh, such. If, if, a, if an individual is breeding, then here's the probability of detecting them in the breeding state or not detection. If an individual is not breeding, same thing, probably of not breeding. And one thing that would potentially be interesting in this model and a generalization one might think about is actually having uh, a non-zero quantity right there where it's highlighted. Specifically, maybe there's a possibility, and this is just a, just a different model, but if an individual is in fact a breeder in a particular year, we might observe that individual, but not recognize it as an actively breeding individual. That in some instances could potentially happen if you see it out of its nest without young or something like that. So we could think about different uh, biological questions right here, different representation of observation with this row right here in which breeders might potentially be detected as correctly as breeders or misidentified as non-breeders or not detected at all. So different generalizations of this model, um, which we'll talk about later, Olivier will get to things like this um, later, but the point is the generality and flexibility of these HMMs. So this, all ought to feel similar to you. Once again, we have uh, three states, breeders, a live breeder, a live non-breeder and dead, and observations not seen, identified, correctly identified as a breeder and correctly identified as a non-breeder. And those are all correct identifications in this model. Uh, same prior distributions for these parameters. 
Um, the transition probabilities, this again is the model formulation of that gamma matrix, the transition matrix, the same thing we talked about already. And the observation matrix, we discussed this, we, we saw exactly this um, for in terms of two detection probabilities, probability of detecting breeders, probably detecting non-breeders. And then the likelihood, this is exactly the same as we had before, I think in fact identical to the previous. Um, we hard code the first observation as y minus one, we'll make this run faster, and the two categorical distributions specifying the latent states and the observations. Posterior inferences, we could think about uh, some of these questions we asked. You know, for example, survival of breeders might be a little bit less than survival of non-breeders. We'd have to really look at the credible intervals on this to be sure. You can kind of see it here. There's a little bit of overlap between those, but it's easier to see uh, with this plot here, where we can actually compare these parameters a little bit easily. Uh, survival of breeders might in fact be less than non-breeders. The transitions, probabilities between breeding and non-breeding status don't seem to be significantly different. So no, no difference there and detection probabilities such. So this is a multi-state model between two different states, breeding and non-breeding. Um, but there's lots of different things. Um, these are just a small number of different you know, things we could, but reproductive status, temporary immigration out of the, of the study area, individuals leaving perhaps for some period of time, perhaps re-entering the study area. So immigration um, and combination of these life and dead encounters, like I said, recovery probabilities of dead individuals. So this, um, this is a more complicated one, the reproduction between first year juveniles, first year non-breeders and second year breeders. I actually, when I looked at this, a small thing here, which I thought might clarify stuff here a little bit. So I'm gonna take a second and just look at this. Um, this, this is the representation of what we're gonna see here. There, there's four different uh, alive states, juveniles, year one non-breeders, year two non-breeders and adult breeders. And what you're gonna see in that matrix right there is the following. Uh, juveniles, when they're first observed here, can transition. Um, oh, and there's one more state, dead, a dead state, um, the born state as always. Juveniles can transition to either year one year olds, non breeders, or they can transition to breeders. And the probabilities associated with those would be survival uh, of juveniles, that's phi one, times the probability of them moving to a breeding sta breeding status, which would be alpha one. So phi one, alpha one, and phi one, the probability that they don't breed in the next year. Similarly, juveniles could die, which is just this one to transition there, which is one minus phi. Similarly, for year one non-breeders, the same thing, they can either not breed in the next year or transition to breeders, full breeding status. And that happens with survival probability phi two, a different survival for year two individuals, times the alpha two, this probability of transitioning to the breeding state. So phi two, alpha two, phi two, one minus alpha two, or they can in fact die with one minus phi two. The year two non-breeders, at this point, they either transition to being breeders in the next year with just survival probability if they survive they are breeders in their third year, or they can die with one minus psi. And finally, we need to define the transitions for breeders and dead individuals. Breeders, if they survive, then they necessarily stay as a breeding state. So there's phi b, or they can die with this one minus phi b. And finally, the, the absorbing state dead has only a self-transition right there. If you're dead, you remain dead with probability one. So I put this together because I thought it you know, helps see what we're looking at right here. And this is all exactly the same thing, uh, just going between these states, juveniles, year one non-readers, year two breeders and dead with all these probabilities of transition right there. So as you can see, these are hugely flexible models and you could even imagine, you know, as I said, immigration out of the study area for a period of time and coming back, different sorts of things. Um, but here's a more complex breeding status transition matrix now with five different latents. The end matrix is here, again, assuming um, imperfect detection, but different detection probabilities for year one non-breeders, year two and breeders, et cetera, but we never misidentify. If someone, if for example, is a year one non-breeder, we always observe it in this state. Year two, we always observe it in this state and breeders, we always correctly identify right there. And the juveniles are never detected. So there's the observation matrix omega. Um, 
for immigration, like I said, another formulation here, we could think of individuals as in or out of the study area and similar sorts of things. You can just think of the psi term, the psi for immigration or immigration going in or out of the study area. And this ought to look very similar to the first ones we did about site A and site B, for example. But here we're just thinking of site A as in the study area, site B is something we wouldn't observe. Note right here, the difference is if you're in the, you're out of the study area, so just formulating this correctly. And there's only two observations here, non-detected or detected. So this is where this is worth scratching your head over for a little bit and just, you know, seeing how this fits in the same framework of these HMMs, where once again, we have transition matrices between three different latent states and now observation matrix. There's three latent states and only two observable states, and that's okay. And as long as we define these parameters and the model correctly, um, it will work. Uh, different uh, encounters. This is this is fascinating. I, I, I can't believe all the things people apply to these two. It's just really, really remarkable. But here, like I said, this is where these individuals who are alive and not just one dead state, there's actually two dead states. This is they just passed away, they just died. And for example, like someone recovered the carcass and they, you know, like ring recovery and they identified it and they found the carcass. So if they're just dead, if someone just died, if they're in this latent state, then there's actually another probability here, R, find this purple dead bird and reporting it to the, you know, the authorities, the monitoring agency and saying, hey, I just found this carcass. It just died this year, here we are. But there's also a one minus R probability of the carcass not being found when it just died. If an individual is alive, there's a different detection probability of us observing the alive animal, P, and minus P of us not observing it. So two different detection probabilities for these two different states. And note, if one individual is dead for a long time, more than a year, there's no chances of us observing it right there. So looking at these different you know, survival probabilities and transitions to the dead state and the just dead state, um, Etc. So it's really, you know, feels almost limitless, the different sorts of models that you can represent with these discrete hidden Markov models. And we've talked about a number of examples here. Um, I'll just close briefly with issues of local minima, which can occur with these. Um, we won't go into too much detail for this data set, um, which fits into this model of transitions between two sites with specific uh, probabilities. Um, in fact, actually perfect survival equals one and imperfect detection, we can fit a model like this. And here's where the data comes from, uh, analyzed formally by Olivier. Um, and here's what the data looks like, transitions between two sites, one and two, and non-detections represented by zero. And this is the deviance of the model, which is uh, represents how well the, the fit of the model and lower deviances represent a more uh, parsimonious model fit better fit for the model as a function of psi two one, this transition probability. So we know there's, low, there, there's a global minimum right here with this transition probability being about 0.8 something, but there's a local minimum right here with this, where this transition probability is actually a little bit less than 0.4. And rather than thinking of deviance, um, so here, if initial values for psi two one are here, we might converge to this local minimum where initial values here converge to that minimum. And this is represented in the MCMC uh, posterior by actually noting that the detection probability is reasonably mixing all around, but the psi one, two, and two, one, there's another mode here in which these two probabilities actually attain this other minimum value where both transitions are actually fundamentally different. So there's two, it is truly a bimodal posterior distribution here. And here we see it in the trace plots, and here we can see it quite apparently in the posterior density plots for psi 1, 2, and psi 2, 1, where the secondary mode right here of the posterior distribution. So this is something to be aware of. Um, this isn't a mistake, it's not an error. This is indeed accurate that the data supports to a lesser degree, a second mode of these transition probabilities. And this is something to be aware of. And this is why it's important always to start your MCMCs at different initial values. Um, you know, I'll say over dispersed with respect to the posterior distribution to identify the existence of potential other modes such as this, which can exist with these multi-state or multi-site uh, models. So just something to think about. Here's more reading about this as well. Um, and it's been about one hour right now. There is um, additional code here in the worksheet uh, doing these same things. 
we did the multi-site models, but for these multi-state models, the same thing right here, um, using this data set of the city shear waters. Um, I have to mention this data set, I have to mention right there, I saw this kindly provided by David Fletcher. Uh, have to mention uh, who is my uh, PhD supervisor. So thank you, David. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and run this, but this does implement the models that we've talked about here for breeders and non-breeders, et cetera. And this is all available to everyone. And also uh, you have to you know, repurpose this code and use it for your own models uh, as you see fit. But most importantly, just the generality of these HMMs and how they can be used uh, to represent a huge variety of things. So I'm basically on one hour right there. I'm gonna stop right here and give time for a little break so you can stay close to on schedule. And um, yeah, Olivia, I'll hand it back to you for, for coordination of time and such. Yeah, let's have a, uh, thank you, Daniel. Let's have a 10 minute break. Okay, let's, uh, let's resume at, uh, yeah, half past uh, 11. Well, for South Africa and France. I don't know what time it is uh, elsewhere. Okay, so in 10 minutes, let's get back uh, in 10 minutes. 10 minute break. Sounds good.
Okay. Let's get back to uh, to it. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, the recording is on. Now the screen. Okay, right. Okay. Shall we start? Shall we? Yeah, okay. Okay, so in this session, we're going to talk about uh, uncertainty in state assignment. So Daniel said a, a few words about it. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, multi-event models that extend multi-state models that we uh, that we saw with uh, with Daniel. Uh, they extend multi-state models with uncertainty in state assignment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a few examples to fix ideas. Uh, this can be a breeding status in female roe deer uh, that is uh, that is classified based on on phone detection. Uh, so if you detect uh, phones, you you are classified as a as a as a breeding female. And if you don't detect uh, phones, you you classified as a non-breeding females. But it might be that uh, just uh, we missed the, the phones. Okay, so there is uncertainty in the assignment of the breeding state to female world here. So these examples are from published paper papers. The state state status is classified or ascertained based on the morphological uh, criteria in Odwin's girls. Um, this is status in house finches is uh, classified based on bird's eyes examination from, uh, uh, okay, so we'll see this example. Actually, we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a go to this example uh, later on in this uh, lecture. Hybrid status in wolves is classified based on genetics and there might be some uncertainty in the way you, uh, you, oops, okay, um, you, uh, in the genetic um, analysis, there might be some uncertainty that makes it difficult to classify uh, an individual as a hybrid. Okay. Dominant status in wolves is classified based on heterogeneity in detection, and there may be there may be some uh, heterogeneity in there, uh, uncertainty in there too. And so the the, the common point uh, between all these examples is that we need to explicitly consider the assignment of state in a model. Okay, and we will use HMM to, to do just that. Okay, and we'll go through, uh, well, actually we won't go through the three examples because they look like each other very much. So we will go through probably the first and the third example. So testing uh, life history trade-offs while accounting for attempting breeding status. Uh, this is dynamics, it's, it's gonna be exactly the same example as uh, the first one. And we will estimate survival while accounting for individual heterogeneity in detection. I'll, I'll show you this example. And we'll go through our live demos for these three examples. Okay, life history trade-offs. We go back to the example that Daniel used to introduce uh, multi-state models. Um, and now we have three states, breeding, non-breeding, and dead, like before. But the difference is in, in the observation. Uh, you have four observations. Um, a bird may be not encountered. It may, it may also be encountered, but in contrast with multi-state uh, capture recapture data, we don't know its state for sure. So that's exactly what uh, Daniel said before. It may be found and classified uh, as a breeder individual. It may be found and classified as a non-breeder individual. So it could be uh, coded too, or it may be uh, found and we are unable to determine uh, whether it's breeding or non-breeding, okay? So that's uh, that's the, what uh, Daniel said. So again, how do the states uh, generate the observations, uh, emit the observations? Well, if you're dead, you cannot be uh, detected for sure, like before. And it's now that if you are a breeder and if you're breeding uh, in that particular year, well, you may be uh, non-encountered, okay? You may be found and classified as a breeder, uh, based on some uh, on some criteria, 
But you, you may also be found, but we cannot really classify your status. We don't know whether you are breeding or non-breeding, okay, for some reasons. Same thing if you are a non-breeder, uh, a non-breeding individual, you may be missed, you may be uh, found and detect and classified as a non-breeder individual, so uh, correctly classified, or you may be found, but we cannot really classify uh, you as a breeder or non-breeder individual. So you're, you're not classified as a non-breeder. Okay, so to wrap up, to wrap up, uh, to wrap it up, each live state can generate three observations. And the only deterministic link is that between uh, dead and observation, non-encountered, observation uh, missed, the zero here. Because if you're dead, you cannot be detected for sure. Okay, now let's specify the model. We start uh, as usual with the vector of initial state probabilities. And there is a big difference with the multi-state models is that in that we need the initial state probabilities because we cannot assign states to individuals with certainty. So we're going to define pi b, the probability that a newly encountered individual is a breeding individual, right? And then um, one minus pi b for the probability that uh, you are initially encountered as a non-breeding individual, okay? And at first uh, encounter, you cannot be uh, uh, dead, so with probability zero. So now the transition parameters uh, are in a table or matrix, whatever you call it, similar to the, the one we use for multi-state models, okay? So you move, you, you move from T minus one in either state, breeder, non-breeder, or dead, to sampling occasion T in columns here, in the same states, be breeder, non-breeder, and, and dead, using these transition probabilities, survival and the transition probabilities from state B to non, uh, NB for non-breeder or from uh, NB to B, right? So it's exactly the same transition probabilities as the one that uh, Daniel uh, used. The only difference, the main difference between multi-state and multi models is here in the observation parameters, in the observation matrix. We introduce two new parameters, beta B, which is the probability to assign an individual in state B to state B. So it's to correctly classify an individual and B and B, the probability to assign an individual in state NB to state NB. So it's a B, beta NB is the probability of correctly classifying uh, non-breeder individual, okay? And PB is the detection probability of breeders, and PNB the probability of uh, detection for non-breeders, okay? So we have these two new parameters, beta B and beta NB for correctly classifying breeder individuals and non-breeder individuals, right? And now, um, uh, same as before, um, conditional on your state, breeder, non-breeder or dead, you may be de non-detected with, uh, with one minus detection probability. Okay. You may be detected as breeder, detected as non-breeder or detected, but your status is unknown. Okay, that's the three here. So if you are, for example, uh, alive and breeding, you may be detected as a breeder individual with probability, the detection probability times the probability of being correctly classified as such, as a breeder individual, okay? You cannot be detected as a non-breeder individual, but you may be detected as a, with a status unknown with some detection probability for the breeder individual and the probability of uh, not being able to classify as a, correctly as a breeder individual, one minus beta b, okay? So this is where the distinction is uh, coming out here with the inclusion, the incorporation of this uh, 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 probability beta B for correctly assigning breeder individuals to that state. And same thing here, if you're alive and non-breeder, you have this probability of correctly assigning a non-breeder individual to that particular state, non-breeding. And here, if you detect it as an unknown uh, with a known status, it's detection probability times one minus the probability of correctly assigning non-breeder individuals to that breeding state, non-breeding state, sorry. And as before, if you're dead, 
you are not detected for sure and you cannot be detected as alive as an alive individual right so that's really the the main difference uh, you have to estimate those new uh, probabilities of correctly assigning uh, individuals to their state breeding or non-breeding state right Okay, there is one subtlety that we need to uh, account for is at first encounter, because all animals are captured, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's for sure, okay? The probability of detection in breeding or non-breeding states are one, okay? So this, the matrix we just seen, you just replace P, the P's by ones and you get this matrix here, okay? So that's really at first encounter the observation matrix has to be uh, defined. Okay, the nimble code now. So as before, that's a good practice to start by uh, defining the parameters in comments, huh? the, the parameters that you, you will estimate, the states that you need, because uh, like Daniel said, I also uh, mess around uh, with the, the, the label of the states, the number, that I assign to the states and, and to the observation. So it's always good to write them down in the comments to be able to go back to uh, to, to to these uh, during the coding, but also six months later, uh, you will thank yourself uh, if you if you spend some time writing uh, uh, well, relevant comments and uh, well, comments in general. Okay, so states one, two, three, alive breeding, alive non-breeding and then, Observations, non-detected one, sinus breeder two, sinus non-breeder three, four, seen, but we don't know your status, okay? The priors, uh, again, sorry, we write the code uh, using this function nibble code, we code the model. Uh, the priors are the same as before. It's all probabilities. We have only two states, so we don't need to do, to use the Dirichlet or, or the multinomial logic link or whatever. We just uh, assign, uh, uniform prior distribution between uh, 0 and 1, non-informative priors, okay? Easy. So now the model, oops, sorry, the vector of initial state probabilities. So remember to kind of start the Markov process, we need to, init to initialize it, to, to have initial states and, and the pro associated probabilities. So here the delta vector, we have three states. And we say, okay, uh, pi b, one minus pi b for being as a, a non-breeder at initial, uh, for having non-breeders in initial state, and you cannot be dead uh, as initial state, uh, you have to be uh, alive. The transition matrix, so as before, once you've written that down on paper, you just have to fill in your gamma matrix in, in Nimble. Huh? with the parameters we, uh, we've seen before, the survival, the transition from one state to the other, and so on. That's basically the same uh, transition matrix that uh, Daniel used for multi-state models. Again, the only difference is in the observation matrix. Now we have to account for the fact that uh, for the observation coded for, you detect an individual, but you're not able to classify it as a non-breeder or breeder individual. So you have to use this beta B uh, probability of correctly assigning an individual to the breeding state and beta NB for the probability of correctly assigning a breeder individual to the, to the non-breeding uh, non state, right? And that's basically it. Huh? And then you'll see that this, um, so now, yeah, there is another difference is that now we cannot really use a deterministic link to uh, to initialize the hidden Markov model. We have to use a distribution for the initial state probability for the initial states for the distribution of the initial state. So we say, okay, at the first um, the first uh, sampling occasion, the initial states are distributed as a multinomial or categorical distribution. Okay? with vector, the delta vector, the pi b, one minus pi b, and, and zero. You cannot be dead at initial state. And then at first encounter, your observation is, uh, is distributed. The observation at first encounter, okay, this is the y, these are the y's here. It's a, it's a categorical distribution and you pick the probabilities 
in the observation matrix that we defined for this particular case of uh, the first encounter. So we called it uh, omega dot init. Okay, it's just uh, the omega matrix, the observation matrix, where the p's, the detection probabilities, have been, have been set up to one. Okay, at first encounter, you detected for sure. And then, as before, you take uh, the rows corresponding to the state, uh, the current state. Okay, so here it's the state at first encounter, huh? at first sampling occasion. And then you take uh, all the columns, one up to uh, 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 the first, up to the fourth column. Right? And then you go through uh, the, the various uh, sampling occasions for, for this particular interval. And then you say, okay, the dynamic of the state is just as before given by the transition probabilities, by the, by the, the gamma matrix, the transition matrix. And you pick the rows corresponding to the state in the previous step, the previous sampling occasion. And for the okay, for the observation, sorry, it's uh, taken in a, a categorical distribution uh, with probabilities, uh, the rows corresponding to the current state of the observation matrix omega, right? So the only differences are uh, these two lines here where you have to account for uncertainty actually. Okay, the results we get is, uh, okay, we get uh, the, the probability of correctly assigning, uh, correctly classifying breeder individuals is uh, 20% and the, prob the probability of correctly Classifying non-breeder individuals is 80%. So clearly there is a difference in, a, in the, the ability you have to uh, correctly assign um, birds. It, it sounds to be more difficult to assign breeder individuals to the, to the correct site, a state, sorry. And, and you can compare the estimates of the detection probabilities, the survival probabilities, and the transition probabilities to um, to the estimates that Daniel got, huh? they are not that different, but uh, it might be that actually, in terms of ecological inference, like uh, the cost of uh, breeding on survival or, or on reproducing, for example, might be affected by the, the fact that there is uncertainty in the state assignment, huh? okay? So if we can do it, well, it's better to do it. Okay, again, visual representation of the estimates to better capture the uncertainty in it. The, the credible intervals in particular. So I think the, the thick line here is for the 50% credible interval and the thin line here is for the 95% credible interval. I should check, but I think that's it. Okay, live demo. Let's have a look to a live demo. So I need to, I need to stop that, yeah. I need to go back to the website and to get the script. Open our studio. Okay. And to move, yeah, okay. Move our studio to the screen I share. Then full screen and it should be okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's load some packages, Nimble, MCMCVs, or the package, uh, uh, the package that uh, Daniel showed you. Let's load, uh, let's read in the data. So it's in CSV file. And uh, why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I need the data, so I'm going to download the data, okay, I have the data, and now I'm at the file, right, and that should be okay now, yeah, okay, and you see if we have a look to the first uh, individual, so in rows we have individuals, in columns we have the sampling occasions, and the, uh, the, these individuals here, for example, it, it was first detected at the last sampling occasions as a non-breeder individual, three or four, 
oh, sorry, zero is for non-detected, one is for detected as breeder, two detected as non-breeder, and three detected but status unknown. So these individuals are detected at the last sample occasion and we don't know their breeding status, right? Okay, let's get back to the code. Nimble code. So I'm just going through the code uh, I just showed you in the slides. Okay, you have the transition probabilities, the observation matrix, and the same observation matrix, but you fix the P's to be one uh, to deal with the first encounter. And then this is the likelihood while you go through uh, each individual and uh, its fate over time. Okay, so let's read that. Multivalent, we call that multivalent. We need to get the first uh, encounter occasion. So this is a short function to do it. So you see that some, our first individuals were captured at the last sampling occasion. It's seven sampling occasions in this data set. And then there are some individuals that were detected at the first sampling occasion, at the second, and so on. Constant, uh, the constants in the list. Um, so this is the number of capture occasions, number of individuals, and the vector of first encounter, the data. So I just add a one to record everything as one, two, three, four, one non-detected, two detected as breeder, three detected as non-breeder, and four detected but status unknown. Initial values. So you can have a look. Uh, there are some tricks to simulate uh, the initial values for the states. Huh? We need to, that's that's something uh, that can take some time to figure out, but we need to simulate some uh, initial values for, or to, to generate some initial values for the, uh, for the states. And I put everything in the function, initial values. That's a very uh, original name. And for the, all the other parameters, um, I use uh, a draw in a uniform distribution between zero and one. Okay. The parameters to be monitored, all the demographic parameters. I could monitor the latent states huh, because they are estimated at the same time, but it would be a huge, I, I don't need them at the moment, but I could, I could use them, I could monitor them, but it would be like a huge uh, um, uh, list of uh, outputs and I don't want that. So let's, uh, Let's stick to demographic parameters and not the latent states. Number of iterations, burn-in period, number of chains, okay. And I again use this function nimble mcmc to run everything at once. And here we go. There is a compilation step. And uh, it should run smoothly. The building. There is some checks that are done by Nimble, we could we could uh, switch them off to maybe uh, uh, speed up this uh, this comp comp compilation step. But this is a this is kind of a, a small model, so we don't need uh, we don't need to really uh, optimize the computational aspects of it. So let's stick to that. And in the compilation and uh, Yeah, take some time. Yeah. Compilation. Okay, and you see that I'm using again MCMC summary to summarize the outputs. And also I will use MCMC plot to get uh, those nice plots I showed you in the lecture um, with the 50% and 95% credible intervals. These are called uh, caterpillar plots. The parameter estimates for the uh, poster distributions of the parameters, sorry. Okay. Hmm. And here we go. First chain, you see it's a bit slower than, uh, than before. We have more states. Okay, and so uh, more parameters to estimate, uh, more latent states as well. So it's it makes the model a bit uh, 
more complex than uh, the multi-state models that uh, that Daniel showed you uh, for the same data set. Well, it's not exactly the same data set because we have the uncertain data, the 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 the, the observation coded for for we we detect an individual but we don't know its state. So we have to account for this uncertainty. Okay, that's the first chain and the second chain. There we go. There we go. You can get rid of the this uh, this progress bar as well. I think sometimes when when you have long computation, long calculations, it can be a bit uh, depressing to see this uh, this uh, progress bar that doesn't really make any progress makes any pro that doesn't make any progress. I think he, there's an option to get rid of that. Huh? When you run a nimble MCMC, let's see. Yeah, progress bar here. Yeah, by default it's true, but you can uh, you can set it up to uh, to false to uh, just hide it. Okay, or you can just go for a coffee or tea. And we're done. Cool. And CMC summary. And here we go. Oops, let me. Yeah. So like we saw in the, in the lecture slides, the probability of correctly assigning breeding individuals is lower, it's 20%, than the probability of correctly assigning non-breeding individuals. So that's something, and it's pretty, uh, pretty well estimated, okay? We, the effective sample size is a bit low for some of these parameters, so we might want to, uh, to run uh, the chains a bit longer. Uh, Okay, there doesn't seem to be any uh, cost of breeding on survival, like the two uh, credible intervals are really uh, overlapping. You could rerun the same model with uh, no effect of the breeding state on survival, with the same survival between uh, for, for all individuals, and maybe compare the two models, or just compare the credible intervals, That's, that could be something else. And you could also assess the cost of breeding on the next reproduction, using these parameters here. Well, there are plenty of things you can do with multi-state models. Here, the only difference we have with uh, the, the model that uh, Daniel showed you is that we account, we explicitly account for the fact that we have individuals for which the state is, is not known, okay? And we could also, um, well, because we, we estimate the states, so we could also uh, kind of decode the states for each individual, whether they, they were breeder or non-breeder individuals. So let's get back to let me let me go back to the lecture slides now. I don't want to say no the slides. So there was this. Uh, oops, the slides. Mm -hmm. Give me a minute. Huh? This one, this one, and we're here. Full screen. Uh -huh. Okay, so we're done with the live demo. What time is it? Yeah, okay. Okay. So there is another example in the lecture slides about quantifying disease dynamics while accounting for uncertainty and disease status. We're gonna go through it uh, uh, quickly because you'll see that it's, it's ecologically, it's very different from the previous example, but, but uh, in, um, in terms of modeling and, and coding in Nimble, it's exactly the same thing. So um, we consider a system of an emerging pathogen, uh, Mycoplasma galicepticum, and its host, the house finch, Carpodacus mexicanicus. That's a house finch with a heavy infection. Okay. Um, and uh, there's been some studies uh, on the impact of pathogen on host demographic rates, okay, by, by those folks here. The problem is that the true disease state for some encounter individuals is not known with certainty because we see them from distance. Okay, so in this context, how to study the dynamics of the disease, the probability of moving from uh, sick to um, uh, to uh, to non-sick individuals, okay, to non-sick. 
So that's exactly the breeding, non-breeding stage. And the uncertainty is that for some individuals, we don't know the status because they are seen from, from distance. So it, it's exactly the same thing as before with those individuals for which, uh, I mean, we detect them, but we don't know their breeding state, their breeding status. So you see that we have the three states, healthy, that would be breeder, uh, ill, that, uh, that would be non-breeder and dead, or dead too, and observation, non-detected, captured as healthy individual, captured as ill individual, and you kept, you're seen from distance, so we know that you're alive, but your health status is unknown. Okay, so that would be detected for uh, a sooty shear water, but we don't know your breeding status. So without any surprise, that's the same principle. Uh, alive states can generate three types of observations with the status unknown. We have the same vector of initial state probabilities, except that now it's healthy in instead of breeder and non-breeder. Okay, same transition matrix, except that you replace breeder, non-breeder, and dead by uh, healthy, ill, and dead. Okay, and now, of course, the meaning of these uh, transition parameters are a bit different. The, the transition from healthy to ill is the probability of getting sick, and the, the transition probability from ill to healthy is the probability of recovering from the disease, okay? So that would be a SI model in the epidemiology terminology. Epidemi um, epidemiology terminology. You may tweak uh, a bit the transition matrix to say, okay, uh, that's a disease that cannot be cured. So you cannot go back from uh, uh, when you're sick, you remain sick. So the probability of going from uh, ill to healthy is zero. Okay. And then this matrix uh, uh, simplifies itself. You can simplify this uh, matrix. Uh, there are plenty of uh, different options. You could uh, you could add other states, blah blah. The observation matrix that's an important part. You see, it's it's really it's exactly the same matrix uh, we saw for the for the Suti uh, Shewata example, except that you replace uh, uh, non breeder by healthy and uh, and uh, non breeder by ill. Okay. And if you run it, you get the probability of correctly. Uh, classifying healthy animals uh, is almost perfect, okay? And the probability of uh, correctly assigning uh, uh, ill individuals is, is almost, uh, is very difficult, it's almost zero, okay? And you have some uh, probability of transition between healthy and ill uh, states, which is around 20%, and the probability of recovering from the disease is about 50%, right? And you could test a bunch of uh, uh, ecological and uh, epidemiological uh, assumptions, hypotheses about uh, how the, the disease uh, circulates in the population by um, um, writing other models and comparing these models between each other, okay? Okay, the live demo, as I said, I'm gonna switch it, but it's in the, in the in, on the website. Huh? It's exactly the same example as the, the Suki Shawata example. And I'm gonna go through, what's this? What time is it? It's noon. Okay, so we have a, so let's give me, give me 10 minutes to go through that. And then uh, we'll have another break. Okay, estimating survival while accounting for individual heterogeneity in detection. So we'll see that with HMMs, we can go a bit, uh, we can we can model basically, uh, well, not anything, but uh, stuff that, used to be difficult to model in capture and recapture models, okay? So we have a single framework, HMNs, with observation matrix, transition matrix, and the vector of initial state probabilities. And then with these three ingredients, you can model uh, basically anything, okay? At least in the capture and recapture framework. Okay, finite mixtures. So it's a way to account for heterogeneity individual heterogeneity. So you have some uh, individuals that are uh, that are assigned to a class or another with some probabilities and you make your uh, demographic parameters class specific, right? And uh, as an example, I'm, uh, I use a lot the gray wolf, uh, which is a social species with some hierarchy impacts, which may reflect uh, in, in species demography, this uh, hierarchy. Uh, a nice picture of wolf. Mm. 
Okay, and um, these developments on finite mixtures, they uh, date back to Charlie Pledger, who in a series of papers, she developed uh, heterogeneity models. Okay, like I said, finite mixtures. And uh, we used this, uh, this, these ideas and we kind of uh, just, we, we didn't uh, invent anything. We just reformulated uh, Charlie Pledger's uh, models in an HMM framework to account for heterogeneity in the detection process. When I say we, it's actually Sarah. Ben. And there's also something in uh, some papers by uh, Roger Pradel, who actually uh, developed those multi-advent models. Uh, like uh, we saw, we will see in the last slide where I give you some uh, some uh, references to go a bit further. Okay, the states. So now we have three states. You are alive in some class, let's say class one, and you have uh, you can be alive in another class, class two. Okay, so we're going to distinguish being alive in one class or the other, and with some probabilities, we're going to assign you to one class or the other, and you might be dead. Okay. Oops, not four observations, but uh, in terms of the data, the detection and non-detection, it's only two uh, types of detections. Either you are not captured, zero, or you are detected or captured with a one, okay? It's just the, the kind of the, the frequency uh, of uh, ones, of series and ones and zero that will uh, inform the model about heterogeneity in the detection process, okay? Because we're gonna use that for heterogeneity in the detection process. We could use it for survival or transition, but here we're going to use it for detection. Initial state probability. So you may be in class one, a light class one with probability pi or class two with probability one minus pi, right? So that's the probability of being in one class or the other. So that's exactly the probability that will kind of uh, assign you to a class or the other of, uh, of heterogeneity. The transition matrix. So you have your states in rows and in columns. So alive in class one, alive in class two or dead, alive at t plus one, well, it's time t minus one. So alive at t in class one, alive at, at t in class two and dead. And so you can, uh, well, if you're alive in class one, you're uh, at t, one, t minus one, you, you're still alive at time t with probability phi. And we don't distinguish survival for uh, individuals in class two, huh? it's phi as well. We could, but we don't do that here because it's not the, what we're after. We're after uh, heterogeneity in the detection process. And also another remark, you cannot move from class one to class two, okay? There is no transition here, it's zero. You cannot move to uh, that class. That's an assumption we make. We could relax this assumption, it's easier. And the transition matrix will uh, look will, will look like uh, the transition matrix for house finches or for Sutishi waters, okay? Uh, you have survival probability, which is the same for all individuals, and you have the probability uh, of moving from class one to class two, okay? So from class one at T minus one to class two at T, right? So it's the probability for an individual to change class of heterogeneity from one to two, or the the the, the other probability from two to one. And now, where the magic the magic operates, it's in the observation matrix as usual. Um, so you have your two types of observations: non-detected and detected. Your states alive in class one, alive in class two, and dead at the same time interval t. And t at the same occasion, sorry, t and t. t, and, t. Um, and if you're alive in class one, you may be detected with probability p, which we're going to index by one to say it's in class one. Okay. And if you're alive in class two, you may be detected with detection with probability p2. Okay. And it's the same detection one here. It's just here we index, we, we make the detection probability different from one class to the other. This is where we incorporate heterogeneity in the detection process. Okay. And if you fit this model, you get that uh, there are, okay, so the survival probability for all individuals is around uh, 80%, okay? And then there is, a, there is a mixture of individuals. You have 60% of individuals with detection probability 40%, and 40%, uh, 40% individuals with detection probability 
0.5. Okay, so that's pi is the, the probability of being in one class or the other, 60% or 40%, and then you have the two detection probabilities here. Right? One thing you need to be aware of is that we, ent well, the model doesn't really, uh, in terms of ecology, it doesn't really make it, um, uh, doesn't really uh, attach a meaning to the classes. It's just us as uh, as humans that we, uh, we we interpret these classes a posteriori. Once we fitted the model, we say, oh, there is a, there is a, a lower detection for class one and a higher detection for class two. So these differences in detection might be related to social status in the world. So you see the, the ecological interpretation comes afterwards. But in terms of uh, statistics and the, the modeling, we just distinguish two classes, but they could they could mean anything, right? It's the ecolog ecological interpretation interpretation afterwards that makes uh, uh, that makes the, the difference. Okay, caterpillar plot to show uh, uncertainty. Uh, you see the credible intervals, and uh, that's all. Yeah. Okay, before I go through. What time is it? Eight, yeah, 10 past noon, okay. So before I go through the live demo for the wolf example, just a, a, a few comments, further comments. So this HMM framework, to analyze capture recapture is very powerful. With the same data, detection and detection in the wolf example, for example, we asked further questions. We just considered different states, right? But the observation didn't change. It was it was still uh, detected and non-detected. Oops, sorry. Yeah, well, that's a revelation, and it's only uh, your imagination which is the the limit. Huh? How to make your so just to convince you of uh, of, of uh, that that uh, it's our imagination that uh, is the limit. Let's uh, let's let's have a look to this example. So for now, what we've considered is uh, we have models where um, we call that first order Markovian, meaning uh, the state at, at uh, the, the future state depends only on the current state and not on the previous state or the past states, okay? You could go a bit further and say, okay, my the future state at T depends on the state at T minus one and also T minus two, not T minus three, four, five, but at least the two previous uh, time steps, okay? So that would be a second order Markovian model. And how to do that? It's kind of easy in the HMM framework. Uh, remember that's the HMM for dispersal with, with two sides, the model that uh, Daniel showed you, okay? We had uh, two sides, A and B, and then some survival and transition uh, movement probabilities between the two sides, and now, if we want to uh, uh, formulate what we call uh, the so-called memory model, to say there is some memory in the in the dynamic of the states, well, to keep track of the sites previously visited, the trick is to consider the states as being pairs of sites and not just one site. So we define the states as AA for alive in site A at T and alive in site, in site A at T minus one. AB, same thing alive in A at T and B at T minus one, okay? B A is for B at T and A at T minus one. And B B, alive in B at T and alive in B at, uh, in B at T minus one, okay? And D is for that. Observations is the same as before, detect, non-detected, detected at site A and all detected at site B or captured, right? It's just the definition of the states that we changed. So that's really the tricky part. Uh, the, the way you define the states will make uh, everything uh, different and will allow you to answer a different question each time. Now the vector of initial state probabilities, uh, you have more than two states. So you're gonna have to use the multimail uh, logit or the Dirichlet, uh, the Dirichlet uh, prior. Well, you'll have to do something to account for the fact that you have more than two sites, two states. It's not just uh, A and N A B. Now it's A A A B B A and B B. So we're going to use these uh, probability of initial states, okay? And for example, pi B B is going to be one minus the sum of all the other uh, probabilities of initial states. And now your transition matrix. 
in the transition between all the states A, A, N, B, B, A, B, B, A, T, uh, oops, there is an error here. Oh, no, it's, it's the same here. Z, T minus one. So there is an error here. It's Z, T minus one is A, A, and Z, T is A, A. Okay. And phi I, G, K is the probability to be inside K at time T plus one for an individual present inside J at T. So that would be the same as before. But the novelty here is that uh, you also arrive inside I at T minus one. So you have a memory here, not just the present state, but also not the state at the current uh, occasion, but also the state at the previous occasion. So that makes your, your model um, uh, remembering about uh, uh, a few things that happened before the current uh, sampling occasion. You can also split uh, the survival between survival and conditional survival doing the transition between uh, those states. Okay. And the detection probability is just that we have PA detection probability on A and B depending on uh, the states. Okay. But because the states are defined at T and T minus one and T, uh, you just have to have PA and PB. Okay. Further reading. The paper by the original paper on multi event models by Roger Prader um, in Biometrics in 2005. And then uh, uh, this paper uh, by Jerome Dupuis in 95, who had kind of the same idea as uh, Roger's idea, uh, but for one specific model, the, the multi site model. And then, uh, and then Roger kind of extended it for, for any kind of models. And then we wrote this review in 2012, where we kind of reviewed. Uh, um, multi event well, models with uncertainty in both in the frequentist and Bayesian framework. Okay, live demo. Let's go through it in what time is it? Yeah, in, in, in five minutes stop. Okay, so I need to stop that. Then I need to go back to the website. Um, I need to open again our studio because I closed it. Here we go. Okay, let's go through the wolf example. Here, yeah, wolf. So now it's a text file. You can have a look to the text file if you want. Yeah. Oops, I can see it. Anyway, well, we'll have a look here in R. So let's read in the data. Uh, if you have a look to Y, to this data, it's just ones and zeros. So for example, this word, the 61 here, uh, was captured for the, well, detected, it's genetic samples, huh? it's uh, scats mainly. And uh, it was detected for the first time at the fourth, Oops, sorry, there is a helicopter passing by. The fourth capture, uh, at the fourth occasion, and then seen again uh, uh, at all the, the subsequent occasions huh? here, right? Okay, the model, we use the function uh, nimble code, uh, the nimble function nimble code, the priors, survival, detection in each class, and uh, the probability of being in uh, initial state uh, class one, alive in class one. And then the transition matrix with the three states, alive in class one, alive in class two, and dead. The probability of initial states, the probability of being initial state uh, alive in class one, in class two, and dead, you cannot be dead. And then the observation matrix. And again, we need to, uh, to, uh, to say, well, at initial, at first encounter, when you first detect individuals, uh, detection is one huh, because you are uh, you are captured at first encounter for because you condition on it. The detection is one, so you just rewrite omega the observation matrix and you set up detection you fix detection probability to be one for all classes. Huh? So it's just the same matrix where you fix p to be one. So we just distinguish it. We say okay, it's omega dot in it because it's simpler. It's more convenient when we write down the likelihood. And again, like in the Suti water example. We go through the, uh, the first encounter here. So we distinguish the states 
uh, it's a categorical distribution with the uh, vector probabilities delta, the initial state probabilities. And then once once you've drawn the initial state uh, initial states, from there you decide for the observation. You say that the observation at in uh, initial encounter, at first encounter, first time here, yeah, is a categorical distribution uh, with probabilities taken in the in the observation matrix where the p's are all ones. Okay, and then the dynamic of the states. Uh, so from t minus one to t, and uh, the observation matrix, the observation here, conditional on the states, you draw observation the distribution for the observations. Okay, here we go. First encounters, the constant, the data, and then the initial values. So that would how to kind of a generate or simulate initial values with this kind of a whole lecture because it can be very tricky to, I encourage you to have a look to what we did here. Uh, there is no, uh, it's not a single way to do it. There is no a single, not a single way to do it, but uh, yeah, so it takes some practice like it's an experience, but uh, it's important to, um, yeah, to, to, to define those initial values for the states not only for the demographic parameters, right? Okay, the parameters to say, the survival, detection probabilities in two classes, and the proportion, whoa, 10,000? Uh, let's go for 10,000, maybe it's a small data, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a small data set. And when it's, yeah, I forgot to, of course. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, because I forgot to. Okay, I don't remember. Yeah, and go. Up. You build the model, you do some checking, and then you compile the model. You see that there is uh, much less uh, latent states and parameters than in the Suti Shawata example. So it goes through the checking and the building uh, much more quickly than before. Compiling now. <laughs> I didn't see you. Uh, I, I, I just read your comment, Guido. The fortune package. I didn't know about that package. Uh, that one is quicker. So we don't have to use that package. Okay. And the summary. And I forgot to uh, load the MC, MC list package. And here we go. So definitely there is some heterogeneity in detection. Huh? There is a, a kind of a 50% of the individuals with a 30% detection probability and uh, well, uh, the other half with a 50% detection probability and survival is around uh, uh, 80%, right? Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm kind of done. Well, I'm done for this lecture. So there is one uh, lecture left, but maybe uh, let's have a 10 minutes break. It's a, it's a, I think it's a shorter lecture. So we should be on time, I think. Or maybe a bit, uh, running a bit late, but that's okay. Okay, so let's come back at uh, yeah 35 uh, yeah 12 35 10 minutes 10 minutes break right okay 10 minutes break
Okay, welcome back everyone. I think it's about 10 minutes. So I will go ahead and get started with um, the final module. And let me go ahead, of course, and share screen. So we have this. Um, this is hopefully um, it's interesting and it is changing gears a little bit from what we've been doing. Um, we've done a lot of HMMs and looking at different model formulations and ways of doing things. Here, we're gonna look more a little bit uh, more at capabilities of Nimble and things you can do, uh, ways to speed up MCMC convergence. As we all know, uh, sometimes things can take a long time to run or converge. Um, and we've only looked at one workflow in Nimble using the Nimble MCMC function. But in fact, actually, um, there's a more refined workflow you can use with uh, Nimble, which gives you a lot more functionality. This, this will show it here, but I'm actually gonna flip to um, just this, which, which breaks this down a little bit. The Nimble MCMC function does everything, as we've said, but the more um, you know, full workflow is creating a model object, the representing the hierarchical model, then creating an MCMC to operate on the model, which you can do by doing configure MCMC or build MCMC, which we'll see. Uh, then you can modify the MCMC. The point is right here, you can make changes to it, do whatever you want, then go through the step of compilation, making everything into C++, and then uh, actually run the MCMC. And so far we've only seen that as all together, uh, but here we're gonna look at some of these steps a little bit. Here is the same information here. Uh, with a little more detail. Uh, Lauren made this slide a long time ago now, and it shows, you know, here's the nimble MCMC, but rather you can create a model and then create the MCMC configuration. This is the same thing we just saw, then build the MCMC and then compile everything. And yes, yeah, so we're gonna look at some of these steps about how you can use this to your advantage. Um, both the MCMC itself and the model object itself, the thing created by nimble model, these are not given to you in WinBugs or JAGS, but in Nimble, they can be available. So here's the same thing once again, uh, these steps going all of these things right here. Uh, we're going to go back to the original Dipper data CJS model um, right here uh, for this and just use this as an example. Here's the model code. Um, once again, running it using Nimble MCMC right there. But the full workflow of doing this, like I said, first takes these model components, the code, the constants, the data values, and creates what's called a nimble model object here, hmm.p for the phi and p parameters. So this just creates the model. Now this model is actually like a tool that you can use in R. Um, and we'll look at, I'll show you in a moment, just some things you can do with it. But the next step would be using this model object right here to configure the MCMC using this option right here, configure MCMC, which creates an MCMC configuration object. And when you do that, um, it actually prints a bunch of information about the MCMC, um, about what's happening, specifically our phi, p, and z, the latent states, and it tells us what sampler metropolis uh, things on phi and p. There's posterior predictive samplers for some of the Z latent states and categorical samplers for a lot of the latent states, a thousand of them. So we can look at these and modify things. You can make changes here, or at least just see what's going on. This output wasn't given to us before. And a little, I'd like to also mention as a side note that uh, this, this concise summary of it didn't exist actually before, but actually when I was with you in Montpellier is when uh, I actually wrote the code for making this concise summary right here, which, which is much more direct to looking at what's going on. Previously, there was just a full blown thing. I'll show that too. Um, then use the configuration object to build the MCMC. And here's the actual executable but uncompiled MCMC. And then you compile this, and this shows two separate compilation steps. They can actually combine and into one, maybe I'll show that so you don't have to do, go through this compilation twice, and then run the MCMC right here using the run MCMC function to get samples, such, and summaries of that. So let me actually just show this and talk a few things about it, but here we are with this dipper data. I'm gonna get quickly just to where we create the model object. Here's the constants, the data, the initial values, et cetera. Um, we're not gonna use this stuff yet. This is for the MCMC, we don't need this yet but uh, we define it right here. Here's the model code, as we've discussed. Here is using nimble MCMC. This is not in fact what I want right here. So let, um, for, the full, for the full example, okay. Um, 
here, nimble, this, this is what we want here for creating the nimble model right here. This is exactly what we described. So this just creates the nimble model object. And we see that right there. Now we can actually look at things in the model. This is a tool we can use. So for example, this right here, the model object right here, we could say, what's the value of phi, for example. Um, and it has nothing in it because something went wrong here. This is not, not what I was intending to show you guys, but there's NAs in it. And we can at least look at the fact that there are NAs. It has a value for P, the detection probability right there. We could look at the latent states, et cetera. Here we do the configuration step right there, which configures an MCMC. And this shows us what we had. Like I said, the previous um, incarnation of this used to just have a print samplers method where we could look at all the samplers and it lists them all. And like I said, this is a little bit hard to uh, digest, but then this by type, which is the default now, by type equals true prints them by type, which is this concise summary right there, which is in fact the default print method of the configuration object, which is what you see right there. And here, for example, you can change the configuration. For example, we have, excuse me, so in this, this version of the model, there's no phi uh, uh, is not a stochastic node, which is why I got NAs for that. Anyway, but maybe we don't want monitors on Z, for example. Note the monitors are including Z, and maybe we don't want that. So we might do MCMC cont dollar sign set monitors and define what we want the monitors to be. And maybe we just want, for example, beta and, for example, P and, for example, SD of epsilon, for example. And now this will, um, I have uh, parentheses off there. This changes the monitors to removing Z as we see. And now if we do the default printing, there is that. And we could modify the samplers as well. Um, we could make changes here as well, show that as well. So this is more of the full blown um, uh, options for how we can modify things. So why is this useful? I'll show about changing samplers as well. So as we saw, we can expect the variables inside the model. For example, um, the gamma parameter, uh, calculate the likelihood of this. The calculate method gives the log density of the model or particular parameters. Uh, so this lets you inspect things. You can change things in the model. I didn't show, but we can assign values into it and calculate, do calculations for likelihoods, et cetera. And this is actually one of the most common errors, mistakes that people have when the MCMC isn't getting started. As Olivier said, um, initial values in particular for the latent states, the Zs can be difficult to get exactly right. And very often people get the initial values wrong. And if the MCMC doesn't have a starting place, uh, a foothold for where to begin from, it can never get started. So for example, here we have a negative infinity for a log likelihood because one of the initial values for something is not, is not appropriate. So in our model, for example, right here, the model was called this. So if we do a model dollar sign calculate, hopefully we get some, uh, so it is not properly initialized at this point. I did something wrong probably because I did have the wrong initial values and such for this version of the model, which is which is indeed my fault. Um, I'm gonna go through the code immediately prior to this. And with any luck, I think this will work with this particular model. Um, try this one more time. It builds this version of the model. And now when we calculate it, it's still not the case. So, so my apologies, I, I don't have the model set up correctly, but this is where we indeed could start with debugging and look at you know, what's going wrong. There's another function, for example, if you're in the situation called initialize info, init info about the model, and it might tell us um, missing values or NAs or non-finite values are in these variables right here, phi, epsilon, and gamma. This is, this is what we need, the information we need right here. So for example, phi in the model doesn't have appropriate initial value, neither does epsilon. And we could look at you know, what was being provided by the initial values right here, this function, and note that perhaps we don't have um, you know, things that we need in that. So there's a lot that you can do with this. Um, in particular here, looking at calculations for particular capture histories, the fifth individual gives us a valid log likelihood. The sixth individual is not correct. And then by inspecting that, you're pulling out the initial values for the sixth individual, the Z values, individual six of the capture history, indeed suggests that this individual uh, died, this represents dead, uh, and then comes back to life, which is not possible. So this sequence of two, one in the Z variable 
uh, leads to an impossible state and a negative log likelihood. And if you have this nimble tries to recover from things like this, there's actually extensive uh, model initialization routines that take place, which is actually far more um, complicated. It never ceases to amaze me uh, how difficult trying to do model initialization and recover from poor initial values is uh, in an automated fashion, not just for one model you doing it yourself, but generally for the whole model. And the MCMC tries real hard to fix things like this and it cannot um, always recover. So if your MCMC doesn't get started right, this is the path you wanna take and look at your model with these tools seen here to calculate for particular nodes and the full model and see where the problem is. So uh, also, uh, changing and modifying samplers, as I mentioned. Uh, there's default samplers that are assigned uh, by the MCMC, and there's a hierarchy I could describe it of how it defines samplers. Uh, are those the best choices? It depends. Uh, it depends on the model. Um, how well an MCMC performs over various sampling strategies model uh, depends entirely on the model structure itself. Um, Stan and JAGS and Nimble and Winbugs all have different default sampler assignments. JAGS um, likes to use inverse CDF sampling when possible for discrete parameters. Uh, Winbugs and Nimble default to do metropolis tastings for continuous value parameters. There's just a variety of things that happen. Um, Stan uses HMC. Uh, and, and are they the best? It, it depends is the answer. Uh, there's also a package called compare MCMCs, which lets you uh, uh, compare different MCMC performances. And you can find that as well. Um, I actually use that uh, in the talk I'll be giving later in the week at ISEC to compare a bunch of different MCMC approaches, including HMC, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, in Nimble, which is what my talk is about, uh, to compare these sorts of things. So you can see some results for that. Um, here uh, is the model that I, I was just making in uh, in the example, but here we actually do have a covariate. We talked about that before. So for survival for five is defined such where there's also a wing length parameter. So we have a coefficient beta one, which is an intercept, uh, beta two, which is an actual coefficient of wing length and a random effect called epsilon, where the random effects epsilon are given by this, a normal distribution with some standard deviation. And the standard deviation is called standard deviation of epsilon right there. And we give that a prior right here, uh, uniform not 10 prior. So this is a different random effect formulation of the model with also a covariate for survival. And the point is the mixing now is going to be more difficult for this because we have these random effects, uh, the epsilon terms and this hyperparameter standard deviation of epsilon. So looking at how this performs, um, this is using the default samplers for epsilon. And we look at these two chains and ask ourselves about the mixing. And it doesn't look very good. There, there's very high autocorrelation here between these samples. And this would be represented as well in the um, effective sample size, the N effective in the posterior samples. So this doesn't look fantastic. How could we improve this? Well, the default sampler here is, like I said, uh, Metropolis Hastings sampling. It's called the random walk sampler, the RW sampler in Nimble. And we see that here when we look at the MCMC configuration. Again, what we see that random walk, as I said, this is the default for nimble um, for non-conjugate continuous valued parameters is being applied to the beta coefficients, P probability of detection and the standard deviation of epsilon, um, these random walk samplers. So that's what's being applied by default. Is that the best choice? We don't know. Um, here we can see the same thing right here, uh, telling us what sampling strategies nimble is using. We can change that. We can try doing something different. Um, you can modify the samplers in the MCMC configuration using functions like remove sampler and add sampler. And actually, um, this is you know not even uh, released yet, but there's actually a new function that you know, as I mentioned, there's things like you know remove sampler right there. That's a function remove samplers. The alias for remove samplers is the same thing. And add sampler is a new function. Replace sampler which nobody knows about yet because it's just in the development version. Replace sampler, I think I made aliases for this and replace samplers, either way works. And this does just what you think, it's really just a combination of, by the way, replace samplers is pretty much a wrapper for remove sampler and then add sampler. Really just does these two things. So replace sampler, say we want to replace and we want to replace on the target node, we want to do standard deviation of epsilon. 
and the type of the sampler we're going to replace it with is a slice sampler. And see, I spelled that wrong, slice or something, you know, not a sampler, something that's not a sampler. This should catch it. And I took great pains actually to make it so that this doesn't remove. If I give it not a sampler, it, it correctly tells us this is not a sampler. It, it notices that and says, hey, that's nothing that I'm aware of. And importantly, the MCMC configuration did not do the removal. It still has this random walk sampler on standard deviation, standard deviation of epsilon. Let's say we give it something that is one, like the slice sampler right there, no longer an error. And now it has the slice sampler applied to standard deviation of epsilon. So why is that important? Slice sampling, if you're not familiar with it, um, uh, invention of Radford Neal, if you guys know him, uh, University of Toronto. It's a more computationally intensive uh, algorithm, which generally has better mixing. So we apply that to the standard deviation of the random effects. And indeed, it improves somewhat, you know, after initial burn-in period, we do get slightly better mixing behavior uh, via slice sampling. And there's even options, you know, it, when you configure the MCMC right here, for example. Uh, at this stage right here, when we did the original configuration, this stage, and it, it did the defaults, you can even, for example, to mimic JAG's behavior, say only slice equals true. And this, instead of random walk samplers, will actually assign slice samplers in place of those random walks. Now we have loads of slice samplers. This will take longer to run, make no mistake, executing, building and executing this MCMC is going to be a lot slower than the Metropolis Hastings. What will you get for it? You're going to get an improvement in the mixing. So th this is just talking about, you know, different uh, ways to, um, let me go back to having the, the default one here, which also has monitors on Z, which I don't really want. Anyway, improving mixing. Um, so this is getting at what I was talking about. What we're really interested in is MCMC efficiency. Uh, which is the effective sample size divided by computation time. You know, it increases computation time using slice sampling, but also increases the effective sample size. So we're getting more posterior effective samples, but it takes a longer time. The quotient of those is what we consider efficiency, which is how quickly our MCMC generates effectively independent posterior samples. Um, so that's the metric we look at. And here we note that with the default sampler, we had this efficiency. Uh, one effective sample per second with a slice sampler, it actually went down in this case. So it wasn't beneficial. So that's what, what I mean by, it's not always certain whether things will get better or worse uh, with different sampling approaches, but it's worth trying different things. And then, you know, using the best MCMC for a longer run. Um, another approach we can use is uh, block sampling. If you have highly correlated parameters, that this is not here. This is the beta one and beta two in this model. I could run it and we could look at the posteriors and make the scatter plot of beta one versus beta two. And we indeed see they're, they're largely independent. So that's not the case. And th 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 this should be the fact actually, because we standardized the wing length, the covariate, um, we subtracted the mean away. So that generally removes the cross chain correlation between parameters. So this is what we'd expect. But if in fact these were highly correlated, then jointly sampling the two of them would be beneficial. And that's done via the sampler called the random walk block sampler, which is joint metropolis Hastings, uh, jointly samples parameters. And this can have a massive effect um, improvement uh, sometimes on the performance. And even so much so, I'll just, I pulled this up in advance, but um, this one old now ESS paper, the environmental ecological statistics, this one, which was actually the formulation this made actually originally the, um, the nimble ecology, the algorithms in here are what later became the nimble ecology package. Then the same goose example, and these are all the things, these latent state formulations of the model. And then instead we look at marginalization, which we'll talk about just very briefly. Here's all these transition and observation matrices, all the same things. And in the same goose data set, here's the dipper data set, and we do filtering. This is marginalization gets way better. Uh, what I want is the goose one because the goose data set, um, has also block sampling for it. Here it is, this one. When we did the filtering approach, we got a good increase. And then with block sampling, the correlated parameters gives another, the point is the blue bars are way higher than the green ones and another factor of five something, you know, increase in sampling efficiency. This is all effective samples per second or efficiency. So again, the point is we can massively increase MCMC performance using some of these strategies, including block sampling of correlated parameters. So something to think about. Um, here, once again, we could remove some of, uh, here, this says that now random walk block sampler on beta one and beta two. 
So, um, yeah, the last thing I'll just say, I just want to mention marginalization briefly because we're, we're more or less out of time, but there's a package called Nimble Ecology. Uh, this one right here, Nimble Ecology provides marginalized distributions for HMMs, for capture, recapture, uh, and occupant model, and generally hidden Markov models, which is what we're talking about today. And what that does is entirely removes these latent states from models, the Zeds, Get integrated out and instead we use customized distributions for example the hidden markov model for the observations note there are no longer zeds in this model the dhmm integrates over them which is actually a summation in the discrete hidden markov model case it uses the omega and the gamma matrices and the initial probabilities etc and directly calculates these likelihoods so in some cases, this runs faster. In some cases, it's slower. It depends on the model, but usually mixing will improve drastically using this. And what we're interested in is mixing per runtime. So take a look at Nimble Ecology um, if you're not familiar with it, and it provides these marginalized distributions for lots of uh, parameters. So I'm about out of time here, and I apologize. But um, yeah, there's also the weighted likelihood approach, which uh, was also proposed in this paper. And um, whereby, and I think we have it right here, um, but the, define a multiplicity of, uh, so in these functions right here, uh, it's not actually shown here, but it's an approach when you have repeated, repeated um, capture histories, you can actually remove the latent states and weight the likelihood, weight it according to the number of times those are repeated and greatly improve mixing as well. So, I'm going to stop right there. There's a lot that can be said about this. Uh, there's a lot possible with Nimble beyond just standard HMMs and Nimble ecology and uh, different sampling methods and ways to configure things. And there's a lot to do. So everyone give it a look, try it out and everything. And I'll stop right here in just a few minutes for Olivier to conclude. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, if well, I have a few slides, like uh, less than five minutes, to, just to uh, as a conclusion. So let me share that. Yep, here we go. Uh, yeah. So a few uh, take-home messages and recommendations for conducting your own analysis. Um, so we hope to have provided you with a. Uh, a useful overview of how to use hidden Markov models to analyze capture recapture data. So we we have only scratched the the, the surface of what you can do with these models, and we were limited in time. And uh, but uh, to help you go further, yeah, we have a we have assembled a searchable list of HMM analyses of capture recapture data uh, to get some inspiration. So if you click, if you click on the link. Yeah, let me let me show you what. Uh, yeah, so you have this uh, a list of papers with some. Uh, well, I have two columns: one for ecological topic and the other one for methodological keywords. And you can have a look. Uh, you can have a look to these papers. Uh, these are all HMM uh, implementation analysis of capture recapture data. Okay. And for most of them, you, you, you might be able to, uh, you may be able to find the code as well. So that's very, um, that's very nice. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the slides. Clack, clack. Okay. Uh, it's not, it's not exhaustive, huh? uh, far from it. And we'll continue updating, updating more. Well, we continue to update it. <laughs> Feel free to suggest papers to add to the list uh, if you have some. And before we leave, we'd like to give you a few pieces of advice. Well, that's not, uh, well, it's just a few, a few pieces of advice we have from experience. Huh? Um, first things first, make sure you spend some time to make your ecological question explicit. Okay, that's something we forget because we always, we, we kind of right away uh, did, uh, um, yeah, going to the code and trying to do things. And uh, well, this step will help you to stay on course and make the right choices. Um, for example, it's okay to use a subset of your data to address different questions. Think uh, in terms of modeling, 
um, in terms of modeling, uh, don't jump on your keyboard right away. Spend some time thinking about your model with pen and paper and make sure you have the observations and the states of your HMM because once you have them, it's kind of, a, you've seen the model, it's, it's basically the same model again and again and again. The only thing that changes, uh, the only things that change are the, the transition observation matrices actually. And then write down the observation and transition matrices on paper and, and then you can code, you can go from there and try your, your code. Okay, start simple, all parameters constants, for example, make sure you have some convergence and then you can start from there and, and from there and make your, your models a bit, uh, a bit uh, uh, more complex and at, uh, one step at a time, okay? Okay, um, when it comes to model building, we haven't had time to show you that, but uh, it's nice to kind of, uh, considering uh, simulating data to better understand your model. You will always learn something on your model by seeing it as an engine to generate data instead of estimating its parameters. Okay, that's very, very useful. I, we did that for the survival example, I think at the very beginning in the first lecture. The cool thing is with Nimble is that uh, you can model, yeah, you can model, uh, you can use your model to simulate data. And there is a tutorial for that. So there is this link here uh, and you will be able to have a look to an example where you can use your model you've written in Nimble to simulate data. Okay. Um, well, another advice quite general in programming, uh, do not try to optimize your code uh, straight away. Yeah? Make it work first and then think of optimization. Uh, another advice uh, that I always give is um, uh, to read this paper by Gelman and collaborators, Bayesian Workflow, that was published in 2021. Uh, it's more recommendations on Bayesian analysis. Uh, they, they have a workflow for Bayesian analysis and they discuss model building, model comparison, model checking, model validation, model understanding and troubleshooting of computational problems. I mean, these are very general advice pieces of advice that are valid for any kind of uh, modeling. Okay, till next time, we will update the workshop website with the uh, video recordings or feedbacks. We'll fix uh, the typos we've, uh, we've uh, found out, we've found. And there is a longer version of this workshop at this link here with a frequent, frequently asked question uh, section from a workshop we gave uh, last year, I think. We run last, last year. So it's, it's supposed to be a two day workshop and we kind of uh, uh, condensed it in a, in a half a day, uh, which might explain why we, uh, we had to uh, skip a few sections. And last, there is a, a book on its way, hopefully. Uh, I'm writing that uh, actually, I'm writing this book uh, uh, right now actually. And there is an online version um, here at this link and more hopefully in uh, uh, next year. And that's that's the end, I think. Yeah. And it's one thing. Okay, so that's uh, that's the end of the, the workshop. Okay, half a day. That was quite a challenge. Um, okay, uh, we hope you found it uh, useful and feel free to uh, yeah get in touch by email or whatever and enjoy the, the rest of the conference huh? for the rest of the week. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you, Daniel. Do you want to say a few words? Just No, no, you said all, Olivier. Thanks for the conclusions and the good links. Everyone do follow up on those links, Olivier, uh, yeah. put there, because those are fantastic. Um, very, very felt rushed. Everyone, and keep in touch with both of us if you're trying these methods or yeah, need sure. help or anything you know we we are happy when people um yep definitely okay see you thank guys you. thank you very much yeah. <laughs> bye hi stacy hi anna and uh, yeah see you guys enjoy the, the rest of the conference bye cheers cheers <laughs>